hello and welcome. Connoisseur is a fine common cardboard. We've just done a little audio check there to today's live stream today on Gary, Gray Merchant of Asphodel for CPDH Competitive Popper Commander. My name's Ryan. I go by Papa Popper online. And today we're going to be talking about Gray Merchant of Asphodel. Very stoked to have you all here. I'm in a gold mask because our boy wears a gold mask too, and I felt it was only fitting. So uh, stoked to be here. We're back in 2024 with yet another Let's Build. Stoked for a new year. We've got a lot of exciting things coming. If you all want to give me a quick mic check here, let me know that we're coming through loud and clear. And we're going to wait for people to trickle in here for a moment while we, uh, while we get started here. Making sure all our audio and video is all dialed in. Coming through clean and clear. Thank you, Alex. Appreciate it. Excellent. Okay. Well, without any further ado, let us talk about Gary, Gray Merchant of Asphodel. Now, we aren't talking, we're, we're going to talk about a variety of different topics today that kind of encapsulate uh, mono black um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a kind of a building strategy, a building archetype. Um, a, a way of constructing your black decks that is going to lead you to success. And we're going to talk about packages, things that partner together well, and, and systems that are going to work really effectively when you're building your CPDH deck. Let's make sure we got the uh, YouTube chat coming through so you can see yourselves talking here. Uh, there it is. Bada bing, bada boom. Make sure it's all coming through here. Yep. There's the chat. You gotta find the chat. Well, we'll leave that for now and we'll get on with it. So today, what you can learn to expect is why black is all about artifacts now. We're also gonna learn about why black has a new resource advantage engine centered around those artifacts and a number of other spells. We're gonna talk about how to grave flicker to victory. We're gonna talk about how you use these powerful protection spells in ways that allow us to abuse and reuse ETBs while also obtaining that creature back from the graveyard. We're also going to talk about something that I've been quite excited about lately, which is how to survive while also ending the game with some of the unique tools that Black has. Very efficient ways of dealing damage to everybody while also gaining life. And also how to maximize Tortured Existence, a very powerful card in Black, very unique common. And then finally, why you better have a damn good reason to not be running cranial plating. Now, this is, of course, we're kind of memeing here. Obviously, there are decks like Loyal Subordinate that, uh, that don't use cranial plating. It doesn't make sense there. There are decks where people don't play that. But cranial plating is a fabulous card, and there's a lot of decks out there that should be running cranial plating, particularly when you're ramping. But first of all, we're going to cover a little bit about Gary. Now, we're not talking about Gary the Snail. We're talking about Gray Merchant of Asphodel. Now, Gray Merchant of Asphodel is five mana for a two four. You all are probably familiar with the card. When you ETB, you're going to drain everybody for X, where X is your devotion to black. And then you're going to gain life equal to the life lost this way. So it's going to be triple, often case, most of the time, triple the amount that you drained, okay? And this is incredibly powerful. Um, Gary is a card that you often see in the 99 of most black decks because it's phenomenal. It's a, it tends to be a pretty swingy card. It will um, sometimes end the game for a certain number of players, or if you're losing, it can really uh, bring you back from the brink. So this is a great card because it is both saving your life and ending the game. It works phenomenally well with cards like Oubliette, Basically, any sticky permanent that doesn't, isn't likely to go away is a great place for Gary. The other thing is that black needs ways and loves ways to gain life while doing other things because its card advantage engine traditionally has cost it a lot of life. Cards like Sign and Blood, Knight's Whisper, Read the Bones, and not Siphon Mind, but those main ones and a lot of other ones um, lose you life to draw you cards. Now, this is a great rate. Two mana for two cards has always been good enough to make Sign and Blood and Knight's Whisper really exciting cards in black and very good reasons to be in black. Um, traditional draw engines looked like this. This was 
you know, base mono black had all of these cards in it most of the time. You would often see some of these decks uh, splashing into like Succumbs to Temptation or Blood Pact as ways to draw more cards at instant speed. Um, in this case, three mana. And again, these would lose you life. And then later on, we got cards like Foreboding Fruit and Pointed Discussion, which were kind of uh, pointed discussion in particularly was kind of like a second copy of read the bones because it is allowing you to see more things and it's creating a permanent while foreboding fruit would see in some play in some black decks because the permanent that it created the game object that it created was valuable enough to do that and over time we got printed new draw spells in black and these spells I mean, Deadly Dispute and Reckoner's Bargain sort of took over Popper in 60 card uh, because they're so damn efficient. Um, in PDH, however, they were played, but at times they would sit dead in your hand because there wasn't anything you really wanted to sacrifice. So you were almost kind of like waiting for somebody to kill your commander or there might be other things in play that you could sacrifice like a mana rock, but you weren't really excited to sack like an Arcane Signet or something like that to your deadly dispute, um, but we would do it, right? We would we would do it for the draw two in the late game in particular when you're sitting on tons of mana, being able to convert your mana base or a mana rock into more cards is phenomenal. We did have some things that you could play that you could sacrifice, but really it was kind of only Icker Wellspring. Mycosynth Wellspring hasn't really seen a lot of play in CPDH. And so it was really mainly Icker Wellspring. And then sometimes in these base black decks, you would have lands built in. Like this is a common practice with the Deadly Dispute decks is to have Vault of Whispers and Dark Steel Citadel. Um, it just built into your mana base because it's basically free. Also, some decks would have like Dusk Legion Zealot or Phyrexian Rager. You might see like a Sanitarium Skeleton, something like that. You know, they're, they're fine to sacrifice, right? They're okay. But we really, we really want to maximize these things. And that made, was made possible by Mephitic Draught and Tithing Blade, both cards that basically leave behind a permanent while, draw, while, while, while in this case with Mephitic Draught, it's kind of like a worse version of, you know, of the Icker Wellspring that has a little bit of devotion to it. And with the Tithing Blade, we have essentially a Fleshbag Marauder for one less mana that leaves a permanent behind. And so with these cards now there, Mycosynth Wellspring is starting to look really good because it's giving us two cards. It's, it's giving us something to sacrifice a permanent. And of course, all of these cards are feeding cranial plating. Um, whether you're creating permanents with the deadly dispute, whether you're sacrificing them to get more cards, all of this stuff makes cranial plating a very scary card in the mid to late game when it can take any one of your threats and sort of immediately make it a big problem, especially because there's a lot of really great black evasive threats, cards like Tortured, um, not Tortured Existence, but um, a Tormented Soul and Changeling Outcast, Dothy Horror, Dothy Slayer, that type of thing. Alex says, Tithing Blade uh, kicks, fleshy, kicks Fleshy out of the format. Sad, but it's so much better. You know, I don't think that it kicks it out of the format uh, because Edicts are still good and the three mana Edicts are still a three for one. Um, we're spending one card to get three of our opponents. Um, it probably kicks out Slum Reaper. Um, Slum Reaper was the four mana one, the four mana Fleshbag Marauder. Um, that probably is the case. I would say that that is true. Um, why, why is the... Uh, oh, sorry. Here, we're going to make sure that the YouTube chat's coming up, coming up clearly here. I'm wondering why it's not showing up. Sorry, y'all. Just want to make sure. Hmm. Maybe it needs to be... Ah, there it is. Excellent. User error, of course, as always. That's how we do it here. But yeah, I think Tithing Blade is a phenomenal card. It goes in the um, sack packages. It's feeding into the sacrifice synergies that we want. Um, but And it is an artifact. And, of course, the backside of Tithing Blade is also a way to end the game, which is pretty dang cool. Now, some of the other stuff that we can doing in, be doing in black that involve card advantage are your Sanitarium Skeleton, Clay Revenant, Persistent Specimen, and if you have a legendary creature in the command zone, Haunt of the Dead Marshes. Haunt of the Dead Marshes, definitely the best of all of them. The ability to scry one is great. Um, it might be that Dead Marshes, you know, is just one of the better black cards for this sort of synergy that you can find because it's three mana to return it to the battlefield if you have a legendary creature. 
um, and you're gonna scry one again. So it's the only one that comes with an ETB. But what these cards allow you to do is leverage the other sacrifice cards, Village Rites, Corrupted Conviction. Um, and in a deck where you're abusing the ETB of your commander, having the Village Rites and the Corrupted Conviction along those uh, three to four cards is really strong when you're trying to abuse Tortured Existence. And Tortured Existence is a card that um, is really interesting. I've, I've played some games against people with Tortured Existence in the past where it is completely and utterly broken. Um, tortured Existence translates to uh, basically never paying the command tax um, or just paying one black basically to get it back from the graveyard. And Tortured Existence also allows you to leverage the most powerful creatures you can play over and over and over again. We're able to turn any trash card in our, you know, any trash creature card in our hand into something in our graveyard. Um, and when we have cards like the Sanitarium Skeleton, the Clay Revenant, and the Persistent Specimen, we're able to swap these cards back to our hand, like with these two. We're able to swap them back into our hand and then pay a black to get whatever we need back. That could be a Vicious Battle Rager, an Undercity, uh, Underdark Explorer. It could be a Fleshbag Marauder. Um, could be a whole bunch of different things. There's a lot of high value targets for that. Could be Gary in this case. Now, one of the better ways to uh, leverage Tortured Existence is of course getting Gary. That is uh, one of the classics. You play a Gary, maybe it doesn't resolve. It goes into the graveyard. You top deck one of these cards and suddenly it's not bad because either you have a Village Rights, a Deadly Dispute, a Reckoner's Bargain, something else in your hand that you're able to convert that one, that one bad card into something good, or we can swap it with Gary, which will be in our graveyard. So if Gary happens to die for some reason, he just happens to disappear and he's going into our graveyard, people are gonna have to either exile him into the command zone where we can play it again, or we're gonna be able to do these kinds of loops with it, which are really great. Now, of course, Persistent Specimen, this one does return to the battlefield. So this one here isn't so much for returning Gary. This is more for working with the deadly disputes and things like that. You have a little extra mana at your end step. Maybe you didn't need to kill anything. You didn't need to draw any cards. So you just bring back the specimen and then you can draw cards in your turn. Um, that works with this one quite well. Or you can use these at end step, return them into your hand, tortured existence, swap them for Gary. And of course, when we're playing all these different ways to sacrifice creatures, it becomes really, really strong with Gary to also run the Grave Flickers. These Grave Flicker cards have the text, whenever this creature dies or whenever it goes to a graveyard from play, uh, we're gonna return it to the battlefield, often with some sort of perk. Maybe we get a little bit of plus two plus zero oh on the front end, or we get a plus one plus one counter on the back end, or we get an aura. Um, like with the Wicked Roll, and we drain everybody when it goes away. But they're all very, very cheap. And these cards work in really interesting ways. Um, they make it really, really tough to attack into us as a Gary player because we can assign our blocker with the Gary, and then we can use one of these spells. And then if they kill it on the stack, it's like, well, it was going to die anyways. And there's even a decent chance that we'll be able to just take one of these six spells or, you know, you know, there's a lot of actually, there's a lot of other ways to do this, like with Witch's Cauldron, um, and just sacrifice it anyways, right? So this makes it hard to attack us. It gives us a way, like if everybody's tapped down, we can go Feign Death and then uh, Village Rites on our Gary, get another ETB. Uh, these are really, really powerful part of any black deck that has a great ETB in the command zone. And Gary is just one of the better ETBs we can possibly have. Um, aside from maybe the initiative or um, something along those lines. But if we're not flickering Gary, this also allows us to flicker things like Fleshbag Marauder. It can allow us to flicker uh, card draw effects. We could go not dead after all on a Dusk Legion Zealot, sacrifice it to draw three cards. And there's a lot of synergies here. These are protection spells after all. That was what they were intended for is protection. Um, we can also call them scams. Um, you know, obviously not dead after all. Um, you know, and uh, Undying, ev uh, Undying Evil, um, and uh, we saw like Malakir Rebirth for a little while was uh, part of uh, Modern. Um, but yeah, these are all just really, really powerful tools in this black uh, setup here. What's up, Slats? Good to see you, dude. And all of these make Gary really, really dangerous. On the defense, on the offense, there's just a lot of really nasty ways to use this. 
The next thing I want to talk about is something that speaks to a bit of the conversation happening in the meta right now, which is a belief, a mistaken belief that uh, that you can't really close out the game fast enough in mid range, um, and particularly in mono black. And and I'm here to talk about why that isn't really true. Uh, we have in black some really fantastic tools for dealing a lot of damage to a lot of players in a deck that is really excited to do that. Um, and these are Okiba Reckoner Raid, Vampire Spawn, Arrogant Outlaw, and Etched Familiar. Um, we can compare these to the red pingers, cards like Reckless Fireweaver, cards like a Firebrand Archer, things like that. Now, of course, some of these have combo potential. You turn them into a pirate um, with a Malcolm or something like that, and there's a, there's a higher upside on them. If they stick around, they can do a ton of damage, these red ones. But um, often they just die, right? They're, they're, there's often they get countered or they die. These cards, um, they might get countered, probably not, but they're going to enter and they're going to immediately do damage and they're going to gain us life. They're going to undo people's damage against us while dealing damage to everyone. And so we can kind of look at a card like Vampire Spawn as three mana, deal six damage to the table, gain two life, and then we have a body. It can attack, it can block, it does all sorts of other same. Same thing with Arrogant Outlaw. Etched Familiar is basically the same thing because this is a card that we can just if we want to get that life drain trigger, and this, this one does some weird stuff. It's an artifact, but it also, uh, people don't want to kill it, right? So they may not block it. They may try to chump with it. They may do other things. But ultimately, we have control of when Etched Familiar dies and when we get that damage. Um, of course, Okiba Reckoner Raid is by far the most efficient of all of them. It's one mana to deal, um, to deal six damage to the table, to gain two life, and then, of course, we get a 2-2 Menace on the back end. There are other ways to do this as well. We have cards like Soul Cage Fiend, um, which makes everybody lose three when it dies. We have cards like Nocturnal Feeder, which I think has been gaining um, a bit of respect lately because it is a two-power flyer, right? As opposed to some of these other cards here, which have no evasion at all and may never connect with somebody's life total. Nocturnal Feeder does have a death trigger. It's a death trigger we're in control of, though, right? and it, then it does have evasion. We have Diagraph Scavenger, which is uh, graveyard hate. It is also a death-touching blocker, which can be very effective, um, drains our opponents if we exile creature cards. And then of course, Malakir Blood Priest does fit in some black shells where we have, for instance, a lot of warriors, rogues, or wizards. Um, this may not be the correct deck for it, but it is two mana for a two one. So it's kind of like a mini Gary in a way. But essentially what these cards are doing is they are dealing damage symmetrically to everybody while we potentially attack the problem player. So we're not ignoring anyone, right? We are moving the game to its eventual conclusion while also buffering our own life total. And in a meta and in a format where a lot of pinging is happening, a lot of incidental damage, whether it's Falconrath Noble, Hissing Iguanar, you know, pingers like Reckless Fireweaver, Ingenious Artillerist, um, you know, your, your, um, the, you know, Galvanic, Al not Galvanic, um, um, your Alchemist, your, uh, Unruly Catapult, uh, you know, Penrigan Strong Bull, Sunshot Militia. There's so much of that. And then you have the black white decks that are doing extort, right? You have like Viscopa Guild Mage, you have Witherbloom Apprentice, you have Thrill Parasite, all of these decks that do symmetrical damage to everyone. A deck like this with black creatures in it that are both aggressive and defensive is allowing you to mitigate against that and really uh, hamper their plans. Gutter Snipe, yep, another great, great call there as well. So that's the end of this presentation here, but now we are going to enter into the deck building. So let's get out of this real quick here and hop into our uh, Mox Field here really quick. Uh, da, 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 Mox Field, okay. Uh, Moxfield. There we go. Awesome. Okay. So here we have Gary the Snail. And of course, this is uh, covering me up a little bit here. Discord video capture. There we go. And we say, oh, hey, it's Jay. Yeah, it's really all about softening your opponents up while increasing your devotion. Exactly. Yeah. That's a really good way to look at it. Um, the 
the idea is with the pinging is that, you know, aggro decks have a bit of a tr bit of trouble with ending the game for everyone if they aren't dealing damage to everyone. And this is something that like loyal subordinate players are really familiar with is like, yeah, you like you're draining, you're, you're hitting everybody. And while you do that, you're probably attacking like the player that needs the most pressure at that moment, which often will be like a combo player. So you're applying pressure to the combo player and you're ending the game for them while also reducing the overall life total so that when you pivot, you're not pivoting onto them at a healthy life total. You're pivoting onto them with a significantly less life. Um, and, and that's really important. But that theme can be integrated into all black decks because these are creatures that can attack. They're creatures you can equip with cranial plating. They're creatures that you can sacrifice, you can block with. They're doing a lot. They can block and defend the initiative, the monarch. Um, they're just really, really good. Um, and they're very efficient. Like a card like Okiba Reckoner Raid um, is well above. Um, let's see if we have it here. Uh, where is it? Um, Okiba. I probably have it under Life Train. Okiba Reckoner Raid. There we go. Um, Okiba Reckoner Raid is essentially one mana uh, for six damage. And if you think about the philosophy of fire discussions that used to happen back in the day around modern burn, they were looking for like, how much mana did you spend for how much damage? And it kind of needed to be like one for three for the most part. And the deck did move away from that. You had cards like Boros Charm, which were four mana for two, but they did other things too. Um, and, and so that math I think is, is good to translate here too as well. So something like six damage, what percentage of that is what what percentage of the total life total of the table is that and it's about seven percent seven eight percent of the life total of the table is gone when you when you cast a reckoner raid or a or something along those lines alex says are we starting over uh starting with a finished deck or are we starting over we have a semi-completed deck here this is something i've done some work on there have been other people who've contributed to this conversation as well we had um Rev Amati, also knows uh goes by Alex um, on Discord, who, um, who sent me his list as well. And I haven't actually spent a lot of time looking at that list. We did talk about it a little bit. And, um, but this is kind of what we're working with here. Um, so we're at 118 cards, and we're going to get this down to 100, looking for your guys' feedback. And so let's go over what we've got so far. Um, there's another class of cards that I wanted to talk about, and I didn't have time to add this into the presentation but it's these Changeling Outcast, Tormented Soul, Dothy Horror, and Dothy Slayer cards. And um, these cards tend to be pretty good against uh, board stalls. They're very cheap. They can just be sacrificed, so they get you on the board really quickly. They work amazingly well with cranial plating, and they're fabulous with the Initiative and the Monarch because we can forge them up, and then they're kind of just you know clocking in over and over again. Uh, yeah, and they're good for devotion too, exactly. They're just permanents. Uh, where Changeling Outcast, Tormented Soul, Dothy Slayer, and Dothy Horror run into a little bit of tension is with our really powerful sweepers. Um, our cards like Pestilence, Drown in Sorrow, Crypt Rats, Evan Carr's Justice, um, Eye Blight Massacre, all that stuff, right? Um, and and that's, that's where these kind of look a little bit worse. Um, so... The question that I've been asking myself, and I'm really interested in hearing what you guys think about this, is are, are cards like, um, for example, um, let's get the Vampire Spawn in here. Are cards like Vampire Spawn just a better version of these unblockable creatures? Because our Vampire Spawn, which I'm having a hard time finding it here. Where is it? Where is she? Uh, Vampire Spawn. There we go. Um, these cards like Vampire Spawn are hitting for six damage for three mana. So they come down on three. When they come down on three, they immediately do six. Whereas a Changeling Outcast comes down on one if you draw it on turn one and will hit for one and then two by the time the Vampire Spawn comes down. So they're similar rate. A vampire spawn is hitting for six for three mana, which is two damage for every um, two dam two damage for every one mana. But we're also getting a little bit of life with it, and we're getting a bigger body, 
right? Whereas the vamp, the changeling outcast is a little more efficient as a creature being played out earlier and does work with cranial plating better, but it doesn't guarantee the damage, right? Whereas the vampire spawn is kind of like, it's just doing it right away. Um, the unblockables can be equipped with cranial plating. Exactly. Yep. So my, my initial thought and my impression is that even though I really, really love this one and Tormented Soul, and I love the double pips on, for example, um, the, Dothy, the Dothy Horror, I believe it is, that has the double pips, um, there's a part of me that would just rather play the spawns. And there's another reason for that as well, which is Kumbaj Witches. Now, Kumbaj Witches is kind of a dirty card. Like, this, this kills a lot of things, okay? One damage to any target and one damage to any target of your opponent's choice. This is a great political tool. Um, one, we can, we can kill a lot of creatures with one damage. We can kill a ton of creatures with two. What we don't want is a lot of one toughness creatures when we're playing Kumbaj Witches. But this is like one of those rare repeat removal engines that's it's really good. It can pick off certain untappers. It can pick off certain commanders. Um, when you start dealing two damage, it can take out a gut. With one damage, it can take out the skeletons. Um, with one damage, it can take out a, um, a Firebrand Archer or an Erebor Flamesmith, perhaps. Um, something like that. Okay, it's Jay says, I think it's a really, uh, it's a, a really a question of whether you really have... Er I think it's really a question of whether you'd have early attackers or creatures that drain and can be left on the defensive because all the can't be blocked creatures also can't block. Yeah, and that's a really good point, exactly. So the, so when you add in the can't block part of it, these cards right here start to look a lot worse than the than you know the vampire spawn, arrogant outlaw, um, Okiba Reckoner raid stuff. So let's start by doing that. Let's let's pull these out for now. Um, I think this is a, a good choice. And Alex says, that's good. Unblockable, uh, unblockable isn't, um, isn't ideal. Well, unblockable is good. Oh, you're saying the can't block isn't good. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. That, that is not, that's not solid. Um, yeah. We'll keep in a Reckoner Raid, Vampire Spawn. Where are the other ones? We've got uh, Diagraph Scavenger, maybe. Arrogant. Is it Arrogant? Arrogant. Outlaw. There we go. Let's drop these under creatures. I like that one a lot. Um, and then I think we can uh, pull these into the sideboard for now. Chain Devil, Faceless Butcher, Phyrexian Gargantua. Might make the cut, might not. We'll see. Um, let's just do that to the sideboard for now. We have Marshmus Titan, which is another one that we could consider. But again, like, so what's interesting is like, when I start to think about these drain cards, it's like a form of unblockability. And I really, really like that. I highly value that. I play a lot of decks that do this strategy of like pinging everybody and focusing one player. So you're like making yourself useful to the table because you're attacking a player who who is presenting as the scariest but you're not doing it for free. Everybody's taking a little bit of damage too, and they're willing to do it because you're dealing with the problem. Yeah, deck looks like Gollum, uh, loves those one and two drops, can't be blocked creatures, but this deck is more mid-range, so probably wants the draining creatures that up devotion. Yep, I, I, I think so. And we're not losing the devotion when we sweep the board, right? Like uh, Arrogant Outlaw does die to the um, two damage sweepers, but Vicious, um, or sorry, uh, Vampire Spawn, Diagraph doesn't. Um, so there, there's some good stuff. But even like comparing it to Marshmus Titan, um, you know, this thing, even if it's like two mana, you know, like like kind of like a, a Gurmag Angler of a sort or one mana, um, we have to be able to get through. We have to be able to get our attacker through. And the Vampire Spawn cards, they just do that. They just land and then they do it. They can also be Grave Flickered. So let's let's take this one out as well for the time being and really focus on this, this uh, flickering thing here. Oh, that's interesting. I haven't thought about draining as can't be blocked. That's exactly right. Yeah, that's the pingers are the same way, right? Like they're they're a form of unblockability, but they're more than that. They're also lifelink. They're lifelink and unblockability. And I think that that's really what kind of swings me towards wanting that kind of stuff. Um, so let's get in here. We're gonna do O gain, O lose, O enter. Uh, we'll actually type creature. Um, and then O, enter, or O, 
uh, leave or O die. Yeah, like that. Uh, blood fountain, replace the unblockable and get the stuff back. We can't find, if we can't find tortured. Yep, blood, blood fountain is definitely a card we're going to like here, along with like Witch's Cottage and whatnot. Uh, we could even play Bleak Coven Vampires, but like look at the math on this, right? This is a really good example of like why the each is so important. This is hitting for four life on one player and gaining four life. Arrogant Outlaw hits for six on the whole table and it costs two less. Um, we really want the each. Each is super important. Even a card like Cauldron Familiar, you know, one mana for three damage. It kind of meets that test a little bit um, and it might have certain ways of coming back. Probably not though. Um, Etched Familiar, we definitely want. Um, <laughs> we can't play Gary. That's pretty funny. Usually he makes, uh, makes the cut. Um, Nadir's Nightblade, we're probably not going to have enough tokens to make this consistent. We're definitely going to want the Nocturnal Feeder. Um, by the time we sweep this up in a sweeper, uh, it will have dealt a lot more damage. Like this one is actually quite premium because it flies. It's actually going to hit for damage, um, which is great. Uh, Vampire Sovereign, also a pretty good one, but it's only target player. The thing that's saving grace about it is that Grave Flickering it, it, it feels good. Um, it flies and it's a 3-4. Um, yeah, Alex, this deck is probably wants to run a few more raised dead effects and other, yeah, exactly. We definitely want more of those. Um, um, so yeah, like Vampire Sovereign could make the cut. Um, I do like the body. It works great with cranial plating because it flies. Um, Malakir Blood Priest might work. We'll have to just see. Um, we're also going to look at, um, O, oh, oh, let's see. We're going to do O each. Um, and then let's do, instead of gain and lose, we'll do O damage because some of them do damage. They don't drain like our, uh, O serrated scorpion. That's the other one. I forgot about that one. Um, and yeah, a lot less giant won't make the cut here. We don't probably have enough creatures in our graveyard to make this really that good. Um, damage each. Oh, and then we can also do O lose. Uh, and that'll get us like blister grub. Um, we've got, where's the other one? We're looking for Soul Cage Fiend. Yep, double black pips are nice here. We have Tattered Mummy is another option. Yeah, Culling the Weak is definitely going to be in this deck. Culling the Weak slays here. Scorpion is really good. Yep, Scor Scorpion's sweet. Uh, Tattered Mummy, I'm not in love with. Um, you know, it, it, it doesn't do it when it ETBs and it doesn't really have a good body, you know? Like, it doesn't attack for any, like, meaningful damage, probably. Um, so I, I, I'm not in love with that. Um, but we've got a pretty good list of the ones we do like here. So let's drop these in the list and get them in play. Man, it's funny. I don't know about you all, but my How Gurmag Angler Has Fallen. I do not play this card in very many of my decks. Gurmag Angler is fabulous in 60-card formats where you can, you know, focus on filling your graveyard. But... Um, I just don't find myself wanting this card very often. I In black, I want to use my graveyard for other things. I want to use it to, you know, I, I, yeah. It's like a one mana 5-5 five, five is good. We definitely like it. But um, when you have it in your opening hand, it just feels so bad. So very bad. <laughs> so yeah, I don't, I don't think that one's going to make the cut. Uh, it's very funny that that's the way it is. Scorpion is great. Scorpion oftentimes just connects for more damage, which is weird because like people are just like, oh, I'll just take the one and I just won't ever block it. And then we sacrifice it and we get more damage off of it. So um, Scorpion, my boy, that's right. Um, yeah, the mummy at number two and Scorpion at one makes it a huge difference. Exactly. Uh, Etched Familiar, definitely going to go in here. Etched Familiar being a three, two is great. Uh, Nocturnal Feeder. And then Soul Cage Fiend Rex. Soul Cage Fiend dealing three is amazing. Diagraph Scavenger is a little bit more expensive. but um, And then we have a couple of cards here. We have some talking to do about other ways to reuse Gary, like Ninjutsu or with Guardians of Koilos or Ancestral Statue to just return it to our hands, um, which could actually reuse the Initiative, the Monarch, um, draw effects. Um, Nonland Permanent also actually involves... Cards like Icar Wellspring, Mephitic Draught, um, hmm, Trailblazer's Torch, Monarch. That's actually pretty interesting. We'll have to keep these. Let's just keep these in the main deck for now. They're kind of expensive, you know, um, but they're, 
but they're they're worth considering. Lost Legion is another one. This is kind of like your Phyrexian Rager. Um, two black pips. It's a 2-3 instead of a 2-2. Two, two. It doesn't lose you life, and it scries two, which I don't hate. Um, so let's drop this into creatures. We'll just pay attention to whether that feels good or not. Um, we're going to get rid of... Let's see. Let's organize these into drain as well. So doop, 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 doop like that. Um, vampire spawn under drain. Soul cage fiend under drain. This one under drain. Tithing blade is a great target as well. Yeah, yeah. Picking up tithing blades, great. It's a good point. Uh, Mr. Will uh, Willis Berto. Will is Berto. Is that how you say it? Mr. Will is Berto. <laughs> Welcome to the chat. Haven't seen you before. Thanks for joining us. Alex says, did you put Executioner's Capsule? I don't see it in removal. Um, it is here. Yep, yep. That's a good one. Um, Bloodseeker is in here too. Uh, Bloodseeker tends to be a really good card um, because it's basically like the front. It's like one of the parts of Citra Priest, which is one of the best cards in white. Uh, Bloodseeker also kind of is the same thing as an arrogant outlaw or a vampire spawn, except that it's like punishing combo as well. I think we definitely want it. The problem with Bloodseeker is that it gets swept up by our sweepers. It gets killed by Kumbaj witches, um, but it's a pretty low opportunity cost. It's just two mana, right? It's a two mana creature. Um, it's also really fun when you can forge this up or if you can flip this off Throne of the Dead 3. So if you fl flip it off Throne of the Dead 3, it's a 4-4, four, four, and now it's actually quite hard to kill. It's a black 4-4. Four, four. It's going to punish anybody who's doing repeat creature under the battlefield. Yeah, yeah, it's a requirement. It's a, it's a very good card. Um, okay, Fleshback Marauder, Lost Legion. I think Phyrexian Rager is a card that, like, I'm just not necessarily feeling super in love with these days. We could play Dusk Legion Zealot. Dusk Legion Zealot basically just being, like, kind of another Ickle Wellspring. Um, yeah. And the other thing guys is like Bloodseeker. Bloodseeker doesn't just punish combo, right? Like Bloodseeker deals more damage than a vampire spawn. Most of the time you play a Bloodseeker and it like, you know, regularly deals like 10 damage or something crazy. You know, it's like everybody's taking a lot of damage from it. Um, Culling the weak, we're definitely going to want in the deck. That's going to make it really easy to do our commander. There's a part of me that wants Dark Ritual in here too because we generate a lot of card advantage and the ability to burst onto the board with some of our value engines is really good. Um, I see a mention of Hopeless Nightmare here. Okay. Um, and we'll get to that in a second, Alex. Uh, Mr. Willis Berto, I just fell in love with the format. Already built a mono red Zada combo. Ooh, based. Zada. Yeah, uh, Zada's great. I've... Uh, my version of Zada in conjunction with, um, with um, oh shucks, I'm forgetting their name right now. Stein, Stein in the in the Comic Connoisseurs Discord channel um, had the uh, the version of Zada on the CPDH deck database when I was running that with uh, Clay and, and a number of other people. So yeah, Zada's great. And Zada's really good right now too, because in my experience, there's a little bit less counterspell running in the, actually, let's put it this way. There's a lot less counterspell running around in the format than when Zada was first invented. When Zada was first invented, it was like all blue decks and it was just kind of impossible to ever win because you just counter Zada and it's over. Um, but nowadays, removal is terrible against Zada. Sweepers are good against Zada. But yeah, I'm glad you're playing that. I've got a list you can check out in my Mox field too if you're interested. Um, okay, Hopeless Nightmare. I don't know that we're going to play Hopeless Nightmare because Hopeless Nightmare isn't a creature. It is Devotion. It does Drain. So we can kind of read Hopeless Nightmare as one mana deal nine, right? Because if we get one Devotion off of it and we play our commander even once, that's nine. That is one, that is 10% of the life total of the table. And we can sacrifice it to scry. Maybe we do want Hopeless Nightmare. Maybe because it's more efficient. It's just very efficient, but it's purely burn. It's not a body, you know, there's not really like any way to reuse it other than these like, you know, ancestral statue type things. Um, I don't know. Hopeless Nightmare feels like it's much better in 60 card than it is in CPDH. But when you're playing Gary in the command zone, I think probably it is. Um... Yeah, I mean, like, in what in what world... Okay, compare Hopeless Nightmare to a Changeling Outcast. Without a Cranial Plating and without the Forge, it would take the whole game of a Changeling Outcast swinging on players to do as much damage as a Hopeless Nightmare does, right? Hopeless Nightmare is going to deal three damage to everybody minimum, and it could deal four. 
The discard isn't really what I want to do. I'm not going to lie, guys. Discarding, mass discard is not very good in this format unless you're, uh, unless you're a combo deck and you're using it as a counterspell, right? If you can discard everybody's hands and then combo off and they don't have cards to stop you, then it acted like a counterspell. But what it does, it puts you in a weird like 3v1. But if you're only in the 3v1 because you're like a, a combo deck, like Abdel Black, for example, then, you know, then that's fine. Uh, Fly Jump says Rex Gut Decks. Yeah, it sure does. Yeah, it's good against Gut. It's good against Kadira. It's it's disgusting against TPI. TPI cannot function with a Sutra Priest or a uh, or a uh, Bloodseeker in play. It's very very bad. Um, yeah, one damage for six discard a card plus the devotion. Yep, yep. And then Nihil Spellbomb and Dross Skullbomb. We probably will play Nihil. We might play Nihil Spellbomb. It doesn't give us devotion, does it? Um, maybe it does. Wait, does it? Is it colorless? Nihil Spellbomb. Yeah, it doesn't give us devotion. It, it's a good one, though, with um, Nihil Spellbomb goes with Costly Plunder, Deadly Dispute, Fanatical Offering, um, Reckoner's Bargain, um, as well as uh, Rowan's Grim Search. Um, so it, it's usually pretty good. I, I like it in these black decks. Uh, although black has access to a lot of good graveyard hate. You know, um, it's... it's uh, um, Oh, what's the one? A fairy miscreant. Uh, miscreant. <coughs> really? Wait, miss. Fair, fairy, fairy miscreant. Oh, macabre. Jesus. <laughs> All right, Fairy Macabre. Yeah, this is really gross with Tortured Existence. Um, it's also double black. It's an evasive black creature. So you can play it or you can use it as Graveyard Hate. We're definitely going to want this as well. Uh, let's put this under uh, Graveyards um, here. And I'm going to catch up on chat here in just a moment. If you all uh, just wait a second here. Okay, so great turn one play. Yep, on the Hopeless Opponents All Pitch a Card. Yep. Um, I'm going to see this list after the live. Thanks for the tip. Yeah, you betcha, Mr. Will, Will Isberto. Yeah, check it out. Um, and also go check out Stein, S-T-E-I-N. He's the one actively playing uh, Zada these days. And I recommend you go check out his list uh, because it may be a little bit more up to date than mine. It almost certainly. And he's actually been winning games with it too. So uh, Ashes to Ashes is great in this deck. Um, I love this card. This is like one of my one of my pet cards in this format. Um, it's three mana, you exile two non-artifact creatures and it deals five to you, but we gain that life back. So it's not a big deal. Uh, high value spell. Um, uh, Hey, just, let's see. Yeah. Just suggested the Nile spell bomb because I only see one graveyard hate in the list ATM. Yep. Very macabre. Yep. That's right. Yep. And these are all going to go, um, this, this is like a pretty good package. I'm, I'm happy with just this right here. Uh, this is going to go into drain. Um, let's get the other drainers in drain, uh, etched familiar in drain. Uh, Basilica Screecher in Drain, Serrated Scorpion in Drain, Okiba Reckoner Raid, uh, Nocturnal Feeder, Soul Cage Fiend. I know some of these are already in there, but I just want to make sure that I, that I get them all. How can I, how can it even be a pet card if it's insane? Well, it's not insane in every deck, right? Like taking five is like kind of a big fucking deal, right? Like taking five is a sixth of your life total. Um, and it might be a lot more if you don't have very much life left. It's actually really, it's, it's a ton, but in this deck we're playing Gary. So, and of course we do need to switch the printing on this. There really is only one printing of Gary and it's, it's this one right here. Um, okay. So we're at 125 cards. We're not going to be able to fit everything in. We do have Omen of the dead. We have blood fountain in here. Omen, uh, offering us a little bit of, um, uh, a little bit of devotion, but we've got to cut a lot of cards. We have 35 car, 35 lands, um, which I do quite like. I like that number. Liliana Spectre. That's a wild Bobby King in the fucking chat. Whoa, my dude. <laughs> What's up, Bobby? Uh, we're not going to be playing Liliana Spectre, Bobby. Um, uh, it is a good aggressive card, right? We're able to attack with it every turn, but the mass discard is actually uh, quite bad right now. Um, if you're playing Abdel Black, 
Liliana Spectre is great because you're going to flicker it and you're going to use that discard as kind of a counter spell. You're going to discard everybody's cards over and over and over again. And then uh, you've got this flyer that you can kind of win the game with. But in this deck, we don't want to discard people's cards because we're not the main problem at the table. The combo players are probably the problem. And I don't want to discard everybody's answers to that. Usually people discard their answers and then they keep their card advantage so that they can recover. Um, but yeah, dude, good to see ya. In every life gain deck, I play Ashes to Ashes. Yep, it's very good. My pet card is Secret Door. Yeah, Secret Door, that's amazing. Um, so yeah, one of the things we're going to see tension with here, guys, is this stuff. These cards right here are always one of the places where I find it very difficult to find room in black decks, right? You want 34 to 35 lands. You kind of want 10 mana rocks or, you know, 10 ways to ramp. Um, you know, you kind of want like 20 pieces of interaction, you know, there's all these like utility cards, there's stacks cards, there's your sweepers and your edicts and your graveyard recursion, your draw spells. Um, and then you get to this point where you're like 10 cards over, right? And then this becomes part of the cut. That tends to be what happens. Um, and that might be where we take some of the drain out because we still have Gary, right? We, we have Gary. Um, so now we do have a lot of mana rocks here. So let's make sure we get that um, in uh, on lockdown. Abdel says, uh, or sorry, Alex says, Abdel is so gross. I built an EDH deck with him in the 99. I had a Tomb of Horrors adventurer and Matt, oh geez, and made two copies of him. Ugh. That's a that's a shameful thing to do. Yeah, Abdel Black is really good. Abdel in general is, is, a, is a heinous magic card. Um, yeah. Soul Stair Expedition is a good one. And Fly Jum, you're going to see Bobby bouncing in his seat from, you know, across the digital universe here, across the multiverse, because uh, Bobby loves Soul Stair Expedition. He's the, he's the original Soul Stair Expeditioner. Um, I think it's a good card. Yeah, like like one mana, it's giving you devotion. Um, yeah, the whole table conceded. Yeah, I mean, that's, that sounds about right. Um Blight Breath Catablepus. Yeah, that's an interesting one too. Now, I really like Blight Breath because it's like you can flip it off Throne of the Dead 3. And when you go deep into your deck with Throne of the Dead 3, it's nice to have cards that kill creatures um, because it means that, you know, if, if you have a way to get to the throne, you have a way to get to removal. So if you don't have removal in your hand, you can find it right? With the throne. And that goes for the edict creatures, but it also goes for faceless butcher and things like that. So let's cut a little bit of our removal first. And Bobby loves it. Yes. Good. He says, good. Soul stare. <laughs> yeah. Soul stare. Maybe, maybe that is what we want. One of the, one of the tough things is that like we have our draw spells, right? And we have our animation, reanimation recovery spells. And this is one of the places where it's like hard to find the balance, right? Now, Witch's Cottage and Mortuary Mire are just free, right? We're, we're obviously never cutting those cards. Like Haunted Fengraf is also an option too. Um, Blood Fountain, Ome of the Dead, like Blood Fountain tends to be pretty staple in almost every black deck. A tortured Existence is not going. Dread Return is fucked up in this deck. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, it's really, really, really good. Uh, I love Dread Return. We're going to be able to use this to like, you know, Grave Flicker, you know, um, you're not high on candy grapple. I love candy grapple. Um, the fact that it doesn't sack creatures is perhaps one of the bigger bummers, you know, but it's my, it's, 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 you know, minus three, minus three for two mana kills almost every combo creature, right? Um, the same thing with final flourish. And minus five, minus five kills Dargo and everything else. Um, Cadaver Imp is good. Cadaver Imp is also a flyer too. Um, yeah, we could do Cadaver Imp. It kind of, you know, it strains our edicts a little, or our, um, our sweepers a bit, which I don't love. And this is definitely a deck that would love to play an Evan Cars Justice, you know? Um, yeah, definitely. Or, you know, we could just play an Arms of Hadar maybe. Victim of Night, though. Yeah, Victim of Night, though, is, is, is very, very good. That card is amazing. Is it not in here? <laughs> Nerd. You know, just like casually missing the best black removal spell other than Snuff Out. Um, we also have Spinning Darkness, which is sick. Um, I think the cards that are going to go there are Candy Grapple and final flourish because our removal is just that good the question is is terror 
better than those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got that one. Thanks for the heads up. Um, I'm actually kind of big on like Terror and Doomblade right now because like black, like what do you want to kill in black? Like what's the scariest thing you want to kill in black? I don't know. It's not my concern these days. Let's just put it that way. Dusk Legion Zealot. And if we're doing a lot of creature sack, then maybe Nested Shambler. Yeah, Nested Shambler is an option. Um, I would be probably more inclined for Dusk Legion. Um, yeah, part of, the, part of the thing we were talking about earlier as well, Bobby, is that part of the draw package right now is like this Icker Wellspring, Mycosynth, Mephitic Draught, like these cards that are giving us like two cards on a permanent that we can sacrifice and neither Dusk Legion Zealot. Well, it kind of is. It's like a body and a card, but it's like we're getting a, we're getting a, a, a physical object and two cards with those. So it's pretty good. Um, I do grapple over terror IMO. Hmm. I don't know. This one just kind of kills everything, which is quite nice. Uh, feed the swarm, you know, may not necessarily be needed here, but it's fine. We've got life to gain. So Kumbaj witches is good. Um, and then we have seal of doom is something that I feel like I've been not playing lately that I maybe should be. Um, there's also like MV equals one O tag, uh, removal type instant. O creature. Um, there's other ones. Yeah. The artifact quality has really gone up lately. It has. Yeah. And I know that you're maybe still paying somewhat attention to, to, to popper. Um, but basically like mephitic draught and tithing blade made Icker Wellspring play, made Mycosynth Wellspring good because Icker Wellspring was good, right? So, yeah, it's just, yeah, black is like nuts right now, Bobby. Like, I, it's, it's a shame that we're not doing uh, CPDH in our local area anymore because it's, it's so good. Uh, it's such an amazing format. <laughs> uh, Ghastly Demise is an option. Um, we also have like uh, Tragic Slip. Tragic Slip probably has to be in this deck, right? We have all these ways to sacrifice Vendetta. Vendetta is probably supposed to be here too. Seal is insane. I think Seal isn't seeing play in a lot of decks that should have it. I think that's that's not an unfair statement. Let's uh, let's cut Terror. Um, and let's get uh, Vendetta in the removal. Vendetta just being one mana is really is really uh, is really great. Tragic Slip's going to be on a lot. Okay, let's go into our draw suite here and see what we can cut. What do you all think about Scion of Alaster? This is offering us um, card filtering and some devotion. I, I, I think that... Um, yeah, we got Capsule. We got Capsule. I'm going to cut uh, Scion. I don't think we want Scion. Um we might not, like our card advantage is so good that like Bonder's Ornament probably doesn't make the cut. Removal with Devotion worth it, like Wither Crown or Yoke of the Damned. Um, if it's a permanent, so if it's an aura-based removal, um, one of the better ones is probably like Paralyze, but Paralyze doesn't really, um, I don't know. You know, I, I think I just part of me just, um, it just doesn't kill the thing, right? Like it, it, it just taxes their mana, which is probably good. It, the fact that it taps it is also potentially useful against like tap and untap decks. The problem with like the yoke, the Wither Crown and the Yoke of the Damned is that they don't actually stick around, right? Because they kill the creature or if they don't kill it, then they, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong on that. But um, what do you guys, what do you guys think? Fly Jump is recommending like your sort of um, dead weight, um, Myers grasp type stuff. Um, Alex says, been missing these streams, been itching to talk about MTG on a high level and very few people actually do that in my group. Well, Alex, I, I, I won't apologize for not being here because I've, I've had other really important things going on in my life that, that, um, that I'm, I'm really happy have happened. I've moved in with my partner and, um, and I've gotten a little break from, from the grind. Um, and you know, gone into the new year, which has been great. Um, but I did miss you all. I did miss you guys. So I'm, I won't, I won't say sorry for not being there. Um, but I, I did miss you guys. Yeah, for sure. It's really fun. It's really fun getting back into it. There's a lot to do. 
Um, my systems are a little out of whack right now, um, but I'm glad that you're enjoying it, Alex, and I'm glad you're here. Bobby says, I think Scion looks great because you can use it during your opponent's turns with sack draw, plus it uh, plays into the graveyard. It does, Bobby. The problem is we have 124 cards, and I feel like that's one of the only ones that doesn't just draw you a card, right? It is probably quite valuable, you know, when you pair it with like the village rights and everything like that. Yeah, Alex, the temptation is always to say, sorry, I wasn't here. Sorry, I wasn't making videos. And it's just like kind of like a, like a frame of speech, right? Uh, but I'm, but I'm you know, trying to be intentional with my language about those kind of things. Um, so yeah, yeah. I'm also sus on Paralyze. Don't think I'm big on it. Yeah, the Paralyze can, I think, um, does it tap down the creature? Okay, it does. It does. So I think the way it works is that you, um, this does kind of mess up an untapper, right? Because it doesn't untap. They have to pay mana into it to untap it if they're playing Gretchen, right? It is cheap. So if you put this on like a Dargo and they're playing our aggro, it's like pretty, it's a pretty big like tempo swing. Um, it doesn't stop a gut from making tokens. It you know, might limit certain combos. Um, yeah, they're not, not super high on it, but we can, we can come back to it. Um, okay, and then all the rest of this here is, is just good stuff. I think Phyrexian Rager can go. I, I just don't think that card is very good. I don't think it's ever been really that good. I, I, I do hate to say, which is Cauldron is another one. Now, Bobby, I'm interested to hear your thought on this as well as everyone else's. Which is Cauldron is a new card that we've gotten that is a bit slow, a bit slow. It's a sacrifice engine that sacks creatures once a turn to draw a card and gain a life. Um, it doesn't usually go away. It is a turn one play. It does add devotion persistently. However, we have so many other ways to draw cards. And to draw two cards, this is five mana and a creature. So there's certain decks where this is fucked up. Like, super good. Like, this card in Corpse Augur is... <laughs> like, yeah. It's, it's busted. It's super busted. Corpse Augur, you know, you, you play it, and then you have this sack outlet just sitting in play, and you, like, draw a card. You, like, gain a life to offset the damage he deals to you, um, and then you draw, like, 10 cards. You know, you just, like, look at the player who has the most cards, and you just draw that many. It's just really good. But in this deck, um, I don't know if this is what we really want. Um, yeah, there's a lot of creatures that try to do the same thing. This one is cheaper than a lot of them, right, to activate, and it is cheaper to play. So it is on a different level than those ones. I think what that illustrates, Bobby, is that is that it just illustrates how bad Bushmeat Poacher, Spark Reaper, Spark Harvester, Mogus, Soul Reaper of Mogus are, right? Like it, it just tells us how trash they are. Um, there is one that, that came out recently called Sirith Ungol Patrol that is, um, <laughs> it's equally slow. Um, th this card, I, this, I think this card is largely unplayable, um, but it is a five, four or five. It's a five mana, four or five. You can pay one, sack another creature, draw a card, then create a food token. Um, it has a lot of upside, but it's like five mana for a four or five that needs to tap to do its thing. So it's like primarily defensive. It's just, it's just, I don't know. It's just really slow. Like some people really like it, but I, I think it's, it's mostly dog shit. Um, if you need the life gain, yes, but I don't think in this. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think it's kind of slow and better with more graveyard recursion. We will have graveyard recursion in here. Fear not. Uh, let's cut Witch's Cauldron. Oh, you do carrier feeder of carrion feeder. Carrion feeder wouldn't work very well here, but um, but yeah, I can see like maybe more generally. I think we can cut Diagraph Scavenger. It's like the not the worst of the drainers, but it is the most expensive. The Death Touch is very good, but um, Lost Legion could also potentially go. Um, I also have Soldevi Adnate. Chat, think about this card in this deck. This is pretty good, right? Like Soldevi Adnate on two, and then on three you like cast Icker Wellspring, 
draw a card, sacrifice it with Soldevi to draw another card to make two mana to cast something else for three. Same with a Nicker Wells with a Mycosynth Wellspring or a Mephitic Draught or a Tithing Blade is a very high tempo play. Play your Tithing Blade, sack the Tithing Blade, play another thing. Uh, and of course, with Gary, play the Gary, sack the Gary. It is busted. This is the only one that here that sacrifices artifacts and creatures. Um, it is a, it's a one, two cleric. Uh, Bushmeat is the only one that costs one mana to do it. Sirith Ungol Patrol also costs one mana. Yeah. Yeah. So I think this is, this is definitely like a card we, we definitely want in this deck. So let's put it under a uh, ramp. Yeah, it just gets you there. You know, like these turns are gonna look stupid. You like play your Gary, you drain everybody, you sack to get the five mana, and then you drain again. Um, I think this is going to be nasty. Uh, you know, Soldevi Adnate also allows you to like tap a mana rock for mana and then sack the mana rock for more mana, which is like big mana turns is pretty cool. Um, I think we're going to want, and actually we're going to put things under mana here instead of ramp. Um... We're going to cut Bonder's Ornament. We don't need that card. Um, I think we're going to remove this tag here. Um, Network Terminal looks pretty good. Star Compass is literally just Charcoal Diamond. Um, and I think we actually... I think, I think we want our stuff to come into play untapped. And we want it to be mostly two. So Felwar Stone is going to be good here. Charcoal Diamond is going to be bad. Thought Vessel, potentially good. Um, and then Network Terminal is like very good, I think. I think it's very good. Yeah, cheating the command tax with Soldevi Avnate is so, <laughs> so bad. It's so gnarly. Oh, man. Yeah. Um, my suspicion is that we're going to have to go down to maybe eight. We'll see. We'll, we'll see. Guardian Idol could go. Guardian Idol doesn't need to be in the deck. Guardian Idol is a really good card. Um, and I'll tell you why really quick, just as an aside. Guardian Idol, when the board is clear and everything is died and somebody has the initiative of the Monarch, you animate your Guardian Idol and you smack someone and you take it and you hold it for at least two turns. At least two turns. Sometimes... You hit somebody with that Guardian Idol or the Fountain of Vicar is the other option and they never get it back, right? And if you play 60 card and you know anything about what Monarch and Initiative do in 1v1 games, there's, you know, it, you can ride that shit to victory. That is like the win, that is a win condition of a mid-range deck, right? Or a control deck. Um, but I think that we are creature dense enough with 29 creatures that we don't need it. It's usually better in a, in a kind of a very controlling deck. Um, it can also save your pestilence. That's a good point, Bobby. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, it sure can. Um, we have other ways to do that though. We could play um, could play Cemetery Gate. I love that card. Let's do Guardian Idol in there for now. Um, I actually do think Thought Vessel is going to be probably pretty good here. We have a lot of strong sources of card advantage. Um. Trespasser's Curse seems good in this deck too. It's like a second copy of Bloodseeker that goes on a player and it keeps our devotion high. We could uh, go down to 34 lands. Our curve is actually like pretty reasonable. Like our curve is pretty low. Um, Gary does want to be replayed, you know, and we do want to have lots of mana for that. I saw a mono red turbo monarch initiative deck that got it out um, turn one or two. Is it was that with um, Blood Boil Sorcerer? That might be the one. I think these are. You guys can tell me what you think of these. For the meantime, I'm going to move them to the sideboard. I think that they're good cards, but Burn with Monarch needs to be illegal. Oh, and Popper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's hardcore. Yeah, Bobby says I got to run anyways, but nice seeing you. Good to see you too, Bobby. Thanks for stopping in, man. Um, hope you're doing well. And um, yeah. We'll have to catch you down at uh, Pioneer one of these days. You know what I'll be playing, and I know what you'll be playing, so I'll, I'm ready to get my, my, my butt beat. 
Uh, be a man, cut a land. <laughs> oh boy, I know. There is the temptation. Um, we could, yeah, let's, let's cut a land. Um, oh, we're actually at 34. Because I've put Mycosynth Wellspring in here and Troll. Oh, the torch. I see. Yep. Yeah, the torch. Um, yeah, you can see the tension we have here. Like, we like all of our removal spells. We like all of our sweepers. We like our reanimation recovery. We like our land count. We like our creatures. So maybe what we do is we cut the persistent specimen, clay revenant, sanitarium skeleton stuff. That's fine. Maybe, maybe we start with the persistent specimen because it doesn't work with tortured existence. Um... This is usually where Kumbaj Witches comes out, but Lost Legion would be fine. Um, the rest of this stuff doesn't really want to go. Darkness is just busted. Um, Hopeless Nightmare is very efficient, right? It is. It is definitely very efficient at dealing damage but that sort of assumes that our goal is to do like a ton of damage to everybody and like gary kind of already does that so this is like a more aggressive card we could cut some removal although the question is would we rather have some you know like removal over some edicts you know maybe like we only play um, you know, flesh bag, chain devil, and tithing blade. That would be fine. Cutting demon's disciple. Three edicts is, is plenty good. Um, total mana sources, 35 plus these here. Um, dark ritual is probably going to be a nice, like, high tempo play that we can, like, you know, we, if, if it's getting value engines out, then that's pretty good. Um, and we can recover that card disadvantage. Um, in lots of different ways. Um, let's see. There's Filigree Familiar, which is kind of like actually what we'd want to play over Lost Legion. Doesn't drain anybody, but it is like a, a creature that draws a card and gains us a little bit of life. I do like that card. There's also like, you know, like Pointed Discussion, which is which is quite nice, creating that permanent. Fell Horseman is one that I really like as well, just as another raised dead effect. Loathsome Curator is a card I feel like I, I, I've, I've not been sleeping on it. I've been very interested in it. Because um, it's a 5-mana five 5-4 five, menace that destroys a creature you don't control with mana value 3 or less. So it's killing a lot of combo creatures, it's killing a lot of commanders, and then it's leaving behind a big body. You just have to sacrifice a creature to go along with it. Hmm. Yeah, let's see. Not exactly sure where we're making 12 cuts here. Probably some amount of removal. We probably have to cut three of these. Um, in which case, maybe like Doomblade. The other ones are just too good. I love Faceless Butcher too. Hitting Faceless Butcher off Throne of the Dead 3. Awesome. Just like put a 5 6 into play and start smashing people with it. Like take their commander. Faceless Butcher is also like broken when you play in these like, you know, these Grave Flicker decks because you can, you can double up on it, right? Maybe we only want four of these. I think four of these is fine. Um, so Feign Death. Malice, don't work with evil. Which of these do we cut if we're going to cut one of them? Like, uh, Undying Evil is nice because it leaves us with a blocker, right? It comes into play untapped. But it doesn't work with Malice or Feign Death. It does work with Not Dead After All, and it does work with Supernatural Stamina. So there's a little bit of a nombo there. And if you don't think it should be these, th these are kind of like, these are kind of like more of these, right? We have a lot of drain. 
And there's a part of me that thinks that and this is one of those funny places where it's like, oh, you've got 11 cards to cut. And it's like, well, there's five of them. This is a common dynamic that I've been seeing when I've been building mono black decks is that these come at the cost of like other stuff you want to be doing in black. They're all busted with Gary. Yeah, the, the one thing we have to keep in mind though too is that we have to do these proactively and nobody doesn't know what's going on when you like cast a feign death on a Gary and nothing's killing it. You know, it's like, okay, we know what's going on here. So I don't really like that because then you like cast it on your Gary and somebody kills it, right? You can't kill it afterwards or they can, but it's not, not smart because then you just, you know, draw cards and it does the same thing. So, um, you know, and, and maybe this is, you know, we have 20 artifacts here. So cranial plating is good. We don't really want to erode our creature count. 24 is a good number. Also a TV show that I used to enjoy that I was like surprised that I enjoyed it now that I look back. Um, okay. Other things. This is usually where stuff like Kumbaj Witches, Soldevi Adnate, you know, maybe these drain creatures. We could cut something like Soul Cage Fiend because it doesn't gain us life. I think that's fine. We'll put it in the sideboard. So we're down to 10. We could, you know, ultimately, like this section of the deck is kind of important, you know? but it's hard to find the other cards. This is oftentimes where graveyard hate kind of takes it, takes the L a bit. Omen of the dead could go. We don't necessarily need that. We have blood fountain and tortured existence in the lands. That's pretty good. Demir house guard is busted with tortured existence. So we keep that. We could go down to 15. If we went down to 15 removal spells, then that would be 15 removal spells, three edicts up to 18, uh, and then three, sweepers oh and we're missing echoing decay that card is really good echoing decay is a, a super staple black removal spell and the reason for that is that there's just a lot of really good targets that have the same name you like target the abdel players tokens and blow up all their blockers and then it kills all the tokens that the tpi player has <laughs> like accidentally or it kills all of the gut tokens, or it kills gut, or it kills most combo creatures. It's like, it's just a great card. I think we should do it reactively more than proactively. Yeah, reactively is the goal. But, you know, I don't know. I mean, this is one of the fun things is that the grave flickers make it hard to attack us. It makes it scary to attack us, genuinely, very scary. Right, because we just have one of these things. It's, this is like a big problem, right? Um, because otherwise, Gary isn't going to be the target of removal. It'll be a target of counter spells. But I think we can cut one of these. Do we want plus one, plus one counters on our Gary? A 3-5 Gary is better than a 2-4 by quite a bit. Um, but we're sacrificing Gary, so we don't really care. So the one thing we wouldn't want is for there to be a Nambo. So let's cut Undying Evil for now. It might be that it's better than one of these, but um, I kind of also like the Supernatural Stamina. It puts him up to four power. So let's do that. And we have 18 kill spells now, and we'll need to get rid of one of those, or a few of these. Feed the Swarm is an interesting one. Feed the Swarm is sorcery speed. It loses us life. And um, destroying enchantments isn't really like our modus operandi. You know, we can, we have lots of other ways of dealing with like an enchantment player's stuff. We just kill their creature. Feed the Swarm does that as well. Hmm. I actually like Execution or um, Seal of Doom quite a bit more than I like Executioner's Capsule. Because even though Seal of Doom is, uh, is more expensive, you pay for it once. Whereas Executioner's Capsule, if you want it to be useful, you have to hold it up for the rest of the game. It is an artifact that we can sack, but generally speaking, we don't want to do that, right? We're not really like excited about sacking our E-Capsule to like Deadly Dispute. 
It's not really, it's not a vibe. Yeah, it's not our problem. That's exactly right. Like problem enchantments for other people are like the pestilence, our pestilence. <laughs> you know, so I think we can cut feed the swarm. Obviously, if our commander gets like oubliated, that blows. But we have so many ways to stop that from happening. And oubliette doesn't see like a ton of play right now. So that's fine. We can cut it. Um, wow, it's funny, actually. Capsule sort of looks worse than seal, a lot worse. Seal of Doom, just free to activate is so, so crazy. And it can't be regenerated is like not irrelevant, not irrelevant. Well, we have cast down. Get that shit out of here. Cast down. Bye bye. Yeah, exactly. You don't have to hold it up, right? Whereas capsule you do. Capsule is really good. Don't get me wrong. It's adding devotion. It's a turn one play, but I don't like how it like taxes our mana, kind of like an honored heirloom does. I think we're gonna experiment with cutting this. It might seem sacrilegious because it's like we're an artifact deck, but 15 removal spells, three edicts, and uh, and uh, three wraths, four wraths, but three here is 21 removal spells. That's pretty good. That's that's a that's a solid amount. We're still a little shy though. Man, I'd love to get the um, blight breath catablepus in here. It's just that it's six mana. Oh, God. Right? And, like, for that mana, we'd probably be looking at Gargantua as well. It is super political. I guess it does sort of, like, if we tap out, then other people can't tap out. I guess that's fair. But then if we tap out and we die, that feels pretty bad. <laughs> Uh, yeah, okay, fine. We'll put it back in the main deck. What are we cutting instead? Um, <laughs> you're hurting me, he says. Oh, uh, now let's get this into the sideboard. I really hate that we don't have Phyrexian Gargantua in here, too. That card is sweet. Because it doesn't really lose you two life. It gains you six life. This card alone gains you six life when you, when you use the commander. which is a lot of life. This is a ton of life, you know. So maybe there's, you know, there could be a world here where we go down on some of these draining creatures here because that's what our commander does. But I like that these are there alongside it. That, that feels good, right? Like these things are doing that job as well. We're not just completely reliant on Gary. We have other ways to accomplish that. Ah, building black decks is such a bitch. It's so tough. Um, it's a good problem to have. You know you're on the right track when you're having trouble. In the tournament that I got a ghost with a cranial plate swing somewhere else. Um, oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there was a ghost of Ramirez with a cranial plating, and because you had the capsule, they didn't come after you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He swung at me, and I told him I was saving it for Abdel and didn't want to hit him, but I would, and he swung somewhere else. That's that's what he... Yeah, exactly. Fly elsewhere, little birdie. <laughs> um, Soul Cage Fiend actually gains us six life, so it gains us three Oh, that's kind of interesting. When you do the math on this, Soul Cage Fiend deals more damage to the table. And because of the extra pip, each pip is three life. So it gains us six, and then we lose three with Gary. So Soul Cage Fiend is actually better than all these other ones. Any double black pip card is gaining us a ton of life. Yeah, Executioner's Capsule is obviously very good. That's 22 removal spells. Now we have eight cards to remove. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. And there's, like, not good stuff. What are we dread returning here again? You can dread return a Vicious Battle Rage or an Underdark Explorer, a Troll. <laughs> Cycle Troll on one. Turn two, Dark Ritual, Dread Return, Troll. That's pretty funny. I like that. Dread Return, though, um, is is good with Gary as well because if you just have three creatures in play and Gary's in the graveyard, like you want it to be. You want it to be in the graveyard, 
So you can swap it with Tortured Existence. Um, then you can just sack three creatures and bring back Gary, but sacking the three creatures reduces our devotion. So maybe this is one of the rare black decks that doesn't actually want Dread Return. I could believe that. And by the way, the reason I have Mycosynth in the lands is because I never keep a, a hand with less than two lands. So if it's in my hand, um, it doesn't, if I have one land and a Mycosynth, then it doesn't count. But if I have two, which is my minimum, and there's a Mycosynth, then it's a third, right? And it's a fourth. It's a very, very good card, I think. And it, it does count in there. Um, we have Rowan's Grim Search. Um, this card is so sick. It's basically like, like uh, it's like Dig Through Time in black. We have 22 draw spells, which is a lot. But this is kind of what it looks like these days. And I'm including the, you know, the, the Monarch and the, you know, the initiative and everything here. Um, Staunch Throne Guard does not give us... Oh, yeah, I see what you're saying there, uh, Alex. It's kind of like it fits in this protection sort of slot. Uh, yeah. It's, it's good because, remember, our devotion comes from other places other than our creatures. We might have a Pestilence. We might have like a Mephitic Draught and a Hopeless Nightmare out, and, and then it's it's good. Um, Rowan's Grim Search uh, is one of the few sack effects that doesn't kill a creature, so it doesn't sack Gary, which is a bummer. Um, and it does lose us life. But, man, like when you when you look at the top four cards and take two of them. It's kind of like a three mana Behold the Multiverse, right? But it's even better than that. Uh, actually, no, it's the same. Uh, is it? Let's see, look at the top four. Um, no, you get to look at the top two. Looking at the top four, and then putting all of them into the graveyard, and then drawing two is basically dig six. And we have 20 artifacts of which only one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them were not stoked to sacrifice. Rowan, Rowan's Grim Search just feels like, I mean, I guess compared to the other one, it loses you life and it's three mana and it doesn't sack creatures. I mean, I could, I could believe it. I could believe it for now. We also have Network Terminal, which is just phenomenal with these cards, right? Uh, and with the ramp and everything. We have 20 artifacts, so it's, it's pretty good there. Um, the next cards are the ones that synergize with Tortured Existence, which is Sanitarium Skeleton and Clay Revenant. I really like these cards. Clay Revenant, however, doesn't provide devotion. It is an artifact, that is good. Um, but the ability to use it with Tortured Existence has been so strong. Um, hmm. <laughs> There's really none of, I don't really wanna cut any of these creatures. We could cut from here. Hopeless Nightmare sort of looks like one of those cuts because it's not a creature. It's not like a body. Um, I don't value the discard. I do think that the damage is quite good. It's basically like it's deal nine, gain three for one mana because we will play our Gary. Our Gary eventually will resolve. Yeah, I mean... Fairy Macabre is just a very good card right now. Um, and so is Nihil Spellbomb, and Nihil Spellbomb works really, really well with um, our other synergies. It's just another way to draw three cards off of one of our sack effects while also you know, bunking somebody's graveyard. Fairy Macabre also being a flyer, it's kind of like a gain six if you play it and then play Gary because there's two pips, so you're going you're gonna to drain everybody for two, 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 two is six. Um 
it's really interesting. The black pips are are actually like really, really important. And it makes me want cards like Gloomfang Mauler, Phyrexian Gargantua, the Catablepus, the Lost Legion. Um, and maybe that's the way we should look at it. Lost Legion actually does drain. So yeah, let's think about it this way. Lost Legion drains for two, drain two, gain six is what the pips on this read. And it scries two, and it's a two, three. Whereas this card is drain three, gain eight. Wow. Drain three, well, it's not just drain three, it's drain nine. Drain nine, gain eight with a Gary. Because we have to add up Gary and the, in the you know, the draining. Um, we're talking about the damage to everybody as well, right? So it's it's on its face. It's loose. Yeah, yeah, okay. Hmm, hmm. Um, let's put this under stacks for the moment here. Um, do, 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 Bloodseeker. There we go. Devotion is super important. Yep. Like... It's important enough that maybe Staunch Throne Guard doesn't make the cut. And maybe Clay Revenant doesn't. Like, it's... it's. I mean, th this card is very good, but not having any devotion on it is, like, kind of, um, kind of sad. Like, maybe we would rather have a Lost Legion in that same spot. I mean, the Lost Legion is good. It's eight devotion, two from Gary, so six from a creature... Um, or whatever is 24 damage. Yeah, it's just so much. So much. <laughs> yeah, it's so much. Um, let's just cut the Throne Guard for now. I think it's it, it's it's actually a very good Monarch creature. The Vigilance is sweet. Pairing it up with Cranial Plating is great. Flipping it off Throne is great. Monarch is just good in general, um, but it is the most expensive Monarch creature, and it's also no Devotion. Um, now we're down to six cuts. Cut clay and spell bomb. I think cutting clay revenant is fine. I really like sanitarium skeleton. It's definitely the better of the two. Like sanitarium skeleton is a one, two that doesn't come into play tapped that has devotion. Um, it is not an artifact, but it's the same body. So. Um, and then we could, you know, maybe we cut something out of here because um, I don't want to cut removal right now. We could cut one more, but these removal spells are so dank. They're so good. You know, like, like Parasitic Impetus is fucking so gross in this deck. I wish we had more of these. Uh, Trailblazer's Torch does not have Devotion, but Initiative is disgusting, right? I, I've, I think I've been mistakenly not putting Trailblazer's Torch in a lot of my decks because it's not like a creature, you know, it, it's, it's uh, because its ability is meh, um, but it's just the initiative, right? And another initiative card in our deck, it's also a permanent, right? So we can sacrifice it to Deadly Dispute and a Fanatical Offering and Reckoner's Bargain. It's not the most efficient there, but just four mana initiative, I think is like, is really good, right? It gets our fifth land for Gary. Um, there are worlds where, where this ability can be useful as an equip for one, but that's really not why we're playing it. Like when we read this card, this just says four mana artifact gain the initiative. That's all it says. Uh, there's some decks where it really does matter. Like, um, <laughs> um, this card in Rilsa Rail is very dank um, because the creature deals the damage like a first strike. We can't recur it. We can sacrifice it. Um, um, yeah, I don't know that I want to cut that to be quite honest. I think there's probably other places we could cut. We could cut the Thought Vessel. Um, I don't think that that effect is super premium. We should also add a Mind Stone there. It, it's good, it's untapped and everything, but so is everything else. So let's just cut that down. Eight mana sources plus this. Um, yeah, so that's like over 40, right? That's just 43. 
it's, it's a good number, 43 mana sources. 43 mana sources is gonna be, is gonna be great. Um, we're down to four cuts, probably something out of here. What's the least efficient? So Serrated Scorpion is very efficient. One mana, um, if Gary has this in play, then we drain everybody for nine. Yeah, one mana. Well, it's not one mana, right? It, it's one mana plus Gary is nine damage. But these increments of nine are really strong because that's exactly 10% of the whole life total of the table. 90 damage is what we need to do. So Serrated Scorpion is good. Okiba Reconorade, Busted, Hopeless Nightmare. Yep, super efficient. Basilica Screecher, one of my favorite black cards because this is going to translate to often going to translate to more damage than than these at the cost of mana. It's a good mana sink. It's an evasive flyer. Works great with cranial plating. Gives us some devotion. Um, it's amazing to hit off Throne of the Dead 3 because it just, it's just so big. It's like a 4-5 flyer. Um, Arrogant Outlaw is a 3-2. We have to attack, which might not be exactly what we're doing. Nocturnal Feeder can attack in the air, which is good. We could do Arrogant Outlaw could go, because we might not have an attacker. We might not have an attacker. It is a 3-2, but I think we can cut that one. Okay. Um, down to the nitty-gritty, folks. Maybe we cut one removal spell. We're at 17 artifact. Basilica stays, definitely. Um, we have both Trespassers and Blood Curse, Bloodseeker, but these are just so good. This is so good. Hmm. 34 lands seems inappropriate in a deck with a five mana commander. Um, I, I, don't, I don't believe that that's correct to do. Calling the weak is... So calling the weak is kind of interesting. It's like, it's good with our commander, but it doesn't help us really get to our commander because a lot of our stuff we don't want to sacrifice. There could be, yeah, yeah, like a lot of our stuff is actually quite good. Like we want it, you know, we, we want that creature. Um, so I'm comfortable cutting Culling the Weak. It's sick when you can like Culling the Weak, Gary, you know, with like one of these and then, you know, like Village writes it and then recast it all in the same turn. It's cool. And, you know, Culling the Weak can be used with like a Serrated Scorpion or, you know, one of these drain effects like Soul Cage Fiend or Nocturnal Feeder, Etched Familiar, that kind of stuff. These are sweet. The ones that die too are, are cool because when we sweep the board, we're going to end up dealing a lot of damage to everyone. Um, let's cut Culling the Weak. I'm, I'm pretty, pretty confident on that one, although I really would love this number to be 10. I really would. You can see that the, the, pre the protection is where the tension is, right? You can get to 100 cards in most black decks without a lot of, like, sacrifice. Um, but the four cards extra has always been a tough one. I've been running into this a lot lately. Here's another question. How many types do we have? We have two warriors, one wizard, and that's it. Okay. I don't think we need flesh bag. He doesn't actually add devotion because he sacks us two. Um, so he puts us down on devotion, uh, even on devotion, doesn't add devotion. Yeah. Um, Fleshbag Marauder though, also like with this stuff, you know, it's, it's, it's real good, but it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't work specifically with the devotion part of Gary, but it does work to like cast one of these on Gary and then cast a Fleshbag Marauder, um, which is pretty cool. Two cards, two cards. Well, they could just be like drain creatures. You know, these, these are just sort of like, you know, we could cut like Vampire Spawn because I think Nocturnal Feeder ends up probably incidentally dying anyways. Although Vampire Spawn doesn't die to the Sweepers. Yeah, this is a, this is a challenging one here. This is a challenging one. We're going to try and 
wrap this one up fairly soon here so we don't keep you all too long. We gotta find these last two. Ironically, like Sign and Blood and and you know and, and Night's Whisper, you know, are 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 often what I've cut because I have other draw engines. Um, but Sign and Blood and Night's Whisper are just good cards. Conditionless, draw a bunch of cards, right? Mm. There is a part of me that's thinking about Trailblazer's Torch and thinking about like Phyrexian Gargantia, you know? Because they're both forms of card advantage. It's just one of them is has double black pips. Phyrexian Gargantia off Throne of the Dead 3 is sick too. It's just huge. 7-7. <laughs> seven, seven. Draw 2 and then Gary and you're going to gain back like... You get gain 6 life off that. Yeah, this is a tough one. It's a tough one. There's so many cards that we're like passing on here that are like so damn good in this deck. A font of return is another one. Return three creatures. Okay. I think what we're going to do from this point here, let's pivot to play testing. We'll just have an extra two cards in our deck. Let's see how it works. It looks like every other good black deck that 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 I like. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not concerned that this wouldn't work. It's got like a reasonable mana base. It has like some mana acceleration. It has tools for everything, right? It, it, there's, there's good stuff going on here, but let's just like put it on display and see how it goes. Phyrexian is super good, really expensive. What does our curve look like? Um, curve is fairly low. Yeah, it's like mostly one, two, and three. There's a little bit of upper end curve stuff. We have seven permanents that cost four. Seven, so uh, let's see, nine. We have 10, 10 permanents with mana four or more. Eleven, 11, 13, 27, 37, uh, 45, 56. So 56, 57, 58, 58 of our spells are, are under three mana, which is great. Three mana or less. So yeah, I'll, I'll probably try and figure out what we want to cut here later on, but let's, uh, let's play test this thing. Let's see how it, how it do. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is a sick hand. Uh, so we go turn one, Hopeless Nightmare, turn two, Trespasser's Curse, turn three, Gary. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Oh, wow. Yeah, Sign and Blood. Okay. So turn one, Hopeless Nightmare. Drain everybody. Um, turn two. Oh, geez. Oubliat, too. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Um, so we don't need to draw cards yet. That's not, that's not where we're at. Um, we do want lands. So I think we're going to go Mycosynth Wellspring. We could go Trespasser's Curse. Or because we don't need the land now, we go Trespasser's Curse and then hope to draw land. And if we don't, we Mycosynth. Yep, we Mycosynth like this. Find our swamp, draw it, play it. And then pass the turn. And let's uh, shuffle up here. Draw. Dark Steel Citadel. Excellent draw. So four mana. So we could... Con I mean, the crazy thing is, like, we don't need to run out Gary. If it's not right right now, then we just go one, two, three um, into Oubliette. And we Oubliette something important. Right? One, two, three, four, five, six, six devotion. This is definitely gonna make us enemy number one if we go up to like 18 life on turn on turn five. Um yep, yeah, Ubli at their commander. Swamp. I think we probably go one, two, and we sign in blood. Draw two. And then we go one mana, Dark Ritual, two, three, four, five, Gary. 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, six. Okay, six. I wouldn't be surprised if somebody countered it here. That's pretty, uh, pretty disgusting. Oubliette for all that devotion. Yep. And then we draw. And you can see we have a lot of sacrifice effects here to take advantage of, right? Um, in fact, last turn, we could have, um, the better thing to do was actually to, instead of sign and blood, we should have costly plundered to get our land, right? So now we go one, two, we go uh, Reckoner's Bargain. Actually, Reckoner's Bargain is better on Gary. So we'll do costly plunder on Mycosynth Wellspring. So it dies, we go and get a swamp into our hand and then we shuffle and then we draw. And that's with this. And then we play our land. One, two, three, four. Yeah, gain 18, baby. That's hot. That is hot. Um, let's go Thorn. And we'll draw a card at end step. Trailblazer's Torch, which is going to be great with Reckoner's Bargain. And then we draw for turn. Crypt Rats. <laughs> so, like, the funny thing is, like, right now... Like that last turn we did tap out, but any turn where we tap, don't tap out and we've got Gary in play and somebody attacks us, they have to like know in the back of their mind that they could just die. They could die. They could like, I put my Gary in front of your big attacker. I, I undying malice it. And if you don't have removal, GG, right? Instead of Gary, you could have flesh bag retained priority on the trigger and then costly plundered it. Instead of Gary, you could have flesh bagged. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, because I had no other creatures in play. Yep, yep, that's fair. Totally. Yeah, that's a good one. When you have no other creatures in play, that's definitely a good use. So here, we probably go one, two, three, four. Trailblazer's Torch. Go find the swamp. Play the swamp. I think we just pass the turn. We draw for Monarch. We haven't gotten any removal this game, which is kind of ironic. We've just drawn like giga cards. Um, and we haven't gotten any of our... I mean, this has been a very functional... Well, we did. We got we got Oubliette. Yeah, we got Oubliette. And we've got Trespasser's Curse on the combo player, so we're probably not dead. Um, but the amount of like attrition that we're in inflicting here is, is brutal. Um, we could go one, two, three if we were really concerned and just Fleshbag Marauder. And I think in this case, we probably Fleshbag Marauder sacking Gary, right? Um, yeah. Just like get him back into the command zone, threaten this. Um, and then uh, upkeep, we're going to put counters on something. And I think what we want to do is put counters on the Fleshbag Marauder, maybe. We could scry too to try and find some like other stuff. Usually Forge is where you want to go. Forge and then Goad. Um, we could also make Thorn of the Black Rose super chonky, but it's a Death Toucher, so it doesn't really matter. We're going to put Trailblazer's Torch on it anyways. So let's just put two counters on this. That means it survives the Edicts. Um, yeah, Oubliette's so good in this deck. Um, okay, there's our go for the Throat. And now we can... Let's just draw some cards. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We could also just recast Gary which would be lethal, I think. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, that's super nasty. We could also, I mean, we've got options. Like turn nine here. This is, so this is a turn nine format. Maybe like late, yeah, like turn eight, nine, probably like eight to 10 is a good way to look at it. Turn nine and we are humming. We've killed things. We've edicted the board. We've established Exodia with our Monarch and our initiative. We have removal in hand. We have a big sweeper. We have graveyard hate. We have a trespasser's curse to stop combo. And we've already cast our Gary once. We've been hitting our land drops amazingly. Let's look at another one. This was a, a great sequence. This also looks really good. We just, you know, turn two, sign in blood, depending. We, we might not want to discard any cards, but let's keep. Seal of Doom uh, it makes me feel very safe. Um... I don't think we want to sign in blood here. I don't think there's any reason to do that. We'll, we'll just wait until there's other stuff to do. So let's do this. We'll go Nocturnal Feeder. 
Although we could also go Seal of Doom into Chain Devil. This and this together is a little awkward, but it's fine. That's the way sweepers work. Um, I think getting, like, not dying early has probably been good. So let's just get Seal of Doom. And then we'll go um, Vault of Whispers into Chain Devil. Although we could, like, sacrifice... Yeah, let's just do that. And then untap. Uh, Soul Cage Fiend is pretty cool here. And what we could actually do is go Soul Cage Fiend. One, two, three. Maybe actually Nocturnal Feeder would be better. Because we're going to be able to play Gary. So let's just do Nocturnal Feeder like that. And then we play Witch's Cottage. Put Chain Devil back on top. And then with the last two, we go one, two, and we draw it with sign and blood. Draw two. And there's the initiative again. And now we're looking at, uh, we're actually, yeah, okay, yep, yep, there we go. Swamp. Now it's really tempting to get Kumbaj Witches out. That's a really good one. Kumbaj Witches, maybe we go one, two, three, four, Trailblazer's Torch. Pick up the Swamp. Something to keep in mind, we don't want to crack Seal of Doom ever. It's Devotion, so cracking it is actively bad for us. We need to leverage it as a political piece. Yeah, I mean, that's fine. That is the cost of the permanent, right? Is that you have to sacrifice it. I'm, I'm fine with that. It's okay. Um, one, two. Put out Kumbaj Witches. Um, I really like how this is progressing. Now, there's a part of me that wants to... Put plus one, plus one counters on the Soul Cage Fiend. Yeah, like that. Because we still have the four. We probably do keep the initiative there. Now we have removal and we can play Gary. So now we play Gary. Gary for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven. Gary for seven. And then we uh, attack. Hold this up. Maybe we need to go for throat during somebody else's turn. We Kumbaj as well. And then maybe we need to use our Seal of Doom. Maybe it was a really, really scary turn and we had to use all that stuff. And maybe somebody takes the initiative from us. We're going to get it back um, this turn. Oh, Fane Death with Chain Devil. <laughs> That's sweet. So we go one, two, three. Um, yeah, I mean, we could totally kill somebody here. So we go like you know, attack some the person with the initiative. And then we can go one, two, three. We could actually just go one, two, three, nocturnal feeder. There's really no rush, right? Like we've been killing creatures. We've been doing our job. And then we do chain devil and we'll sack chain devil or we could sack nocturnal feeder that's also reasonable um, if we'd had one more mana we could have grave flickered actually we do one two three four one two three no we don't okay so we'll just sack chain devil because we kind of want to reuse that creature and we got the initiative back so we goaded and then this turn around i think we might have to block with this if we were to keep the initiative but we can always just get it back with this so we'll not block somebody will take the initiative from us and then we're going to go Blood Fountain. Oh, actually, this is where Crypt Rats is really gross because we take the initiative and then we don't give it back. So yeah, we go take the initiative like that. One, two, three, Crypt Rats. And then one for Thane Death on Crypt Rats. Yeah, I think that's what we want to do. And then pay one, two, three into, maybe we play one, two into Crypt Rats. Yeah, we'll pay two into Crypt Rats. And that kills this. And this comes back with a plus one, plus one counter on it. And then we have one mana up to Crypt Rats again. And we regained the initiative. So this time we're going to draw a card. And we've got Tragic Slip up. So we could also just say maybe there was something big and we have to Tragic Slip it because things died. 
and then we'll tap our Kumbaj witches. Nobody is gonna have the initiative, we have it. We're gonna go into turn 10 and this is where we win the game, right? Um, so we're gonna go look at the top 10 and we're gonna hit a Vicious Battle Rager and Okiba. We can't hit that because it's not a creature. So our only hit is Vicious Battle Rager. Oh no. One, two, three. Okay, we have a four, eight. It's utterly huge. Do that and then draw for turn. Spinning Darkness looks sick here. So we'll go one mana, Blood Fountain. One, two, three, four. Crack it to get back Nocturnal Feeder and Chain Devil. And this is like pretty much GG, I think. Yeah. This is this is pretty bad. We have, you know, double Crypt Rats activations. We have like massive creatures. Uh, we're just doing good black things right now. And uh, you can see that we haven't been like slouching, right? We go for the Throated. We Sealed of Doomed. We Crypt Rats. We Tragic Slipped. Uh, we kumbaj the whole game. We have Spinning Darkness in hand. So, like, that's what I'm looking at here. Like, it, are we functioning in the game? Are we participating meaningfully? And Gary is helping us stay alive and, and helping us close the game. So let's restart. I'm going to do one more of these real quick. This one has no card advantage. It does have Tithing Blade early and a Tragic Slip. It does have Supernatural Stamina with Fleshbag Marauder. That is a four mana play and we only have two lands. We do have a Cranial Plating, which looks kind of bad in our opener. I don't love this. It's a functional hand, but um, I would like something different. This is great. This is what I'm talking about with Mycosynth. This is why I love this card. So um, we draw for turn. We'll go Baron more. I'd love to have played the Serrated Scorpion, but we'll go Serrated Scorpion into Mind Stone. So like this, oh, that's nice. Um, and we'll go, we could also go Mind Stone first and then Mycosynth. Yeah, we'll go Mind Stone first just cause it's, it's like immediate ramp. Um, and then we'll draw, Vault of Whispers was a great draw cause now we can just use four mana on whatever we want, which would probably be Executioner's Capsule Serrated Scorpion. That Dark Ritual is pretty sick here too, actually, isn't it? We go Dark Ritual. Four mana. Trespasser's Curse. And Sign and Blood. <laughs> yeah. This is a hell of a turn three, guys and gals. It's very, very strong, very strong. Like Gary is already going to be really good here. So then we go into our next turn, Dread Return. Interesting. That's going to be nice with Chain Devil. So we're going to go one, two, Mycosynth Wellspring, get back the Swamp, play the Swamp. Basically cost us one mana to do that. And then um, I guess we just like hold up Executioner's Capsule. It's not like super efficient, but... Um, you know, turn four, you know, this might be where we want to use it, but I, I don't think so. We just save it for now. And then we draw Opal Palace. Very nice. Um, I think I do just like casting Gary here. It's not like a huge amount, but what we're going to do is do these two and then this. So these two sacking the Gary with the not dead after all. Gary comes in with a plus one, plus one counter. He's going to drain for one, two, three, four, five. Drains for five. We're going to gain 15. Draw for turn. Um, now we go one mana. Not dead after all on Gary. One, two, three, four, five. Sanitarium Skeleton, Chain Devil. Chain Devil sacrifices Gary. Gary returns, drain for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So now we've drained for 12 in total. And there could have been a world tool where we just like sacrifice it and we don't use the not dead after all. And we just, you know, great dread return it back. Yeah, that's fine. Cause we actually have the creatures right now to do that does reduce our devotion by three. Draw for turn. Network terminal is a good draw here. 
I really like this. Um, nothing to dread return just yet, but we just hold up Executioner's Capsule. Let's say we have to use it. And then end of turn, we go Network Terminal on Mica Synth Wellspring to um, draw a card and discard a card. In this case, it's going to be, ooh, that's tough because I like the Okiba Reckoner Raid. It's also helping us close the game at. Sack the Gary, then Dread Return to flash back. How do we sack the Gary here? Yeah, we don't have any way of getting Gary in the graveyard. So Dread Return though is like, you know, kind of wants to be in the graveyard anyway, so it's fine. We'll just, we'll just do that there. Draw Darkness, probably not that useful, although we are probably drawing quite a bit of hate at this point. We'll tap this to draw and discard. And I think we can discard Swamp, I guess, in this case. Maybe we don't want to do that. Maybe we want to tap this, discard, and draw to draw. And then we don't have anything in the graveyard right now, which is rather interesting. We'll go Akiba Reckoner Raid, drain for one, and then just hold up Darkness, I guess. And play a swamp. Not like a ton happening right now. Let's say we have to use darkness to stay alive, and maybe we trade off our chain devil, which we can get back with the with the witch's cottage. Actually, no, we would trade off the Gary if we could. If big things are attacking us, we trade off the Gary. So let's say we trade off both. Um, yeah, and then we go to our next turn. Seal of Doom, good. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, we have eight, so we'll do this, put this back on top. Uh, and then we'll we'll basically one, two, three, four, five, six, seven for Gary. And we'll Gary again. One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, does anybody know if Okiba Reckoner Raid still has Devotion when it flips? It's kind of an interesting question. I'll probably ask the internet about that. But um, Okay, like that. Gary's in play. Now we go one, two, three. Uh, Seal of Doom. One, two, three, four. Chain Devil. Sacrifice Gary, and then sacrifice Skeleton, this, and Okiba Reckoner Raid. It does not. Oh, that's a shame. But it is still one mana deal. It's still like Hopeless Nightmare that comes on a 2-2 Menace. So it's probably still premium. It does not have the Devotion, though. That is disappointing. We'll sacrifice all this stuff to bring Gary back with our Dread Return. One, two, three, four, five. This is turn 10. That's end of the game, right? So definitely like it. Yeah, yeah. Black Devotion is super sick. This is another great hand, you know? Turn one, E-capsule, turn two. Look how functional these hands look. There's like no weird shit. It just, they just hum. They just work. Um, here we probably go Swamp, Serrated Scorpion, uh, tithing blade like this draw um, you know we don't really have like a ton to do here but we could actually craft with something at some point you looked it up because of tithing blade oh because when you flip tithing blade yeah um, you know we, we have enough lands we could like cycle mind stone oh wait this is our turn four and we can just cast Gary. One, two, three, four, five. Drain for five. Draw for turn. Um, snuff out's a great draw. Um, it's gonna be hard to attack us because we have supernatural stamina and Gary. And this little guy's probably getting in over and over again. So I think what we do is we just play out our land and we pass the turn. And then if anything weird happens, we draw off Mind Stone, draw, Village Rights. That changes the game. 
we snuff something out. Well, we probably don't need to snuff anything out. Maybe we have to go one, two, we crack executioner's capsule. Maybe it's a buck wild turn five. Maybe it's like turn five and somebody's trying to win the game. We go capsule, then we go snuff out and everybody's piling on to stop them. And then at the end, when there's nothing left, we go supernatural stamina on Gary and we go village rights. And we sat Gary and he comes back. We draw two cards. We go drain for four and then we untap. And I think at this point we just go swamp, pay one, two, three, four, five. Oh, we have to craft with a creature. I thought that would have been craft with an artifact. Hmm. Because I would like to flip that. Yeah, we'll just play this. I think after everything died like that, we probably just play Bajuka Bog then. Do that. Blood Fountain. Not that useful right now. Uh, we'll go one mana, Blood Fountain, one mana, discard this to the Blood Token. Nihil Spellbomb is welcome uh, there. We'll just nuke somebody's graveyard with it right away to draw a card because we really just want more cards. Uh, turn seven. So I, I think this has been a pretty good one too. More reason to keep the capsule. Need good one drops. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, good one drops are important in this deck. You can see that every one of these is like, we've had lots of cheap things to do. It's one of the other things I wanted to mention too about like, um, let's go back here really quick, is like, the old black draw spells that went into like three and four mana were harder to cast. Mycosynth Wellspring, Icar Wellspring, Mephitic Draught, all these two mana draw spells, they just fit into the curve better. They're just cheaper. They're just like, and, and you just cheap, more cheaper drawing, you know, rapidly as opposed to like a big chunky four, you know, four mana draw three, you know, or three mana draw two. Instead, we're, we're going bigger on our draw, right? Uh, Network Terminal felt good there. There were things to do with it. Um, so I, I do like that. We're gonna have to figure out where the cuts come from here. It could be that Okiba Reckoner Raid. Um, you know, it's one mana deal six, which is actually really good. That is super strong. Yeah, and, it, and it's got a, a, a two drop or a, an attacker on it. So while you lose devotion, you get an attacker that has menace. So that, that does make up for that damage a little bit. In fact, it could be more in some cases. Um, Serrated Skeleton didn't really do anything for us there, but it could. If you want expensive draw, like Crushing Disappointment, yeah, I know. Crushing Disappointment is, um, you know, it's fine. It, I don't love it. I know it does six damage, which is good, but it's four mana draw two. I just have a hard time finding room for it. I, I, I know the card, familiar with it. I, as I'm going more towards the cheaper draw, cards like this become even less appealing to me. Um, cause it's, it, it is an instant, which is nice, but there's like blood packed and things like that. Um, it deals quite a bit of damage. So, I mean, there is that it's definitely, you know, not unreasonable, but yeah, this is a, this is a, I think this is a perfectly like reasonable take on Gary here. Um, one of the things I wanted to look at here was see if I can find I want to see, um, let's showcase, showcase another version of this, which is, Raven Mati's list. Take a look at that real quick here. Um, oh, oh, there we go. Get back to my face. There we go. Um, okay, so this is uh, one by, um, I'm looking at one here from Rave Amati, a member, active member of the, um, of the, of the server. And he is on four ramp spells. Okay, he's, okay. So this is another direction you could go. Um, the, the only trouble I have with this is that it, it really, really incentivizes like, you know, it makes Gary like the linchpin. And Gary is not necessarily the linchpin. In a lot of these games, it's like, yeah, it's pushing some damage and it's gaining us some life. But like, we only have four cards that are like the Grave Flickers. And so what we have with Rave Amati's list is Feign Death, Not Dead After All, Supernatural Stamina, Undying Evil, Undying Malice, Death Denied, or sorry, not death denied, demonic gifts, fake your own death, 
return to action um, those cards. Oh, dig up the uh, dig up the body is actually a pretty cool card in this deck too. Um, a lot less removal. One, two, three. He's on Disfigure, which is interesting. I think that seems reasonable. It's one mana, minus two, minus two. Snuff out, defile, disfigure, executioner's capsule, innocent blood. Innocent blood is kind of interesting in this deck too, because it does sack Gary um, if we want that. And it's only one mana. He's on Kumbaj as well. So yeah, this is just like a slightly more proactive. He has it marked as mid-range control, but I think this is actually like a Gary Burn deck. It's called he calls it Gary CPDH Burn mid-range control. But I think this one is almost purely a burn deck. It doesn't really have like a lot of ramp, so it's not going to be playing Gary as many times as the build that I have is, but it's on 37 lands. Um, it's not using cranial plating, I don't think. And it is a worthy question. If we're sacrificing our artifacts, is cranial plating where we want to be? I think it's a really good card. But a lot of like our damage is coming from just like draining people, which is actually like extremely efficient. Might be that Gary isn't where our uh, cranial isn't where we want to be. Um, cranial looks a lot better in a deck that has like an invasive commander that also does artifact stuff, like um, old flitter fang. Old flitter fang cranial is stupid, right? It's just like generating so much. Um, but yeah, yeah, is cranial going to do anything? So let's let's take a look. Um, let, I think I think our intuition is speaking to us here. Cranial plating can go. We did have seventeen artifacts, which is plenty. Yeah, we weren't attacking much. And and honestly, like if Cranial is in our opening hand, it's not going to feel very good. But that's fine. Like cards that don't feel good in your opening hand are okay to play. That's totally okay. Um, because like Pestilence is a busted card. You would you play this in a lot of decks, right? Um, and it doesn't look good in your opening hand. Depending, I mean, there, there's some, some decks where you're like, you know, uh, Pestilence in your opening hand and the player's playing Gut and you're just like, <laughs> sweet. <laughs> Um, or Kadira or something like that, right? Um, so if we had like one more cut to make, it would be, you know, and, and actually another card that I'd love to have in here is Gloomfang Mauler. The Torch was very good, Alex, I think in that game. Because remember, it's just a, it's like a, it's like a vicious battle rager without the really sweet body. <laughs> Uh, if it was Battle Rager, you'd be happier. Of course you would. Because this is Battle Rager is like one of the best cards in PDH. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, if we could run another one, we would. If we could run Eric Crocker Sneak or like, I don't know, just any other four mana initiative card that like came out of body. Like if there was an initiative card that was like four mana for a one one that gave you the initiative, I would still play it. I would still play it. It's so, so, so good. Um, but Trailblazer's Torch is just like exactly what you want to be doing in like, in like mid-range decks, um, even this one. And the fact that it leaves behind a permanent is, I think, good enough. Um, so we'll probably differ on that one. We could cut like a single removal spell. We have a lot of card draw to get to everything. Um, I really liked how the drain worked. The drain felt really good because it's like 11 cards that drain plus our commander. It's really 10 because Tithing Blade is a little inconsistent in terms of like whether you're going to actually flip it or not. Um, but like it's, it's actually a very interesting mix of both like we have great reactive tools. We have a lot of ways to not die. We have Wraths. We have ways to get our creatures back. Um, we have like protection spells. We have graveyard hate. We have 21 spells that draw cards. And that doesn't include like blood fountain. Well, it does include blood fountain. Um, and tortured existence technically is kind of like card draw a little bit. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot to like about this. Um, the, the other question is like, is sanitarium skeleton worth it in this deck? Simply for tortured existence. So like, if those two cards ever go together, then it becomes very easy to do stupid Gary things. Um, Um, does the flip hit everybody though? Each opponent. So it's, it's not like a massive amount, but if you're like at the end of the game and you just have like, 
like a like a serrated scorpion in the graveyard and you just like have a bunch of mana then it's like not nothing you know it is slow it's very slow it's not why we play the card right maybe we want the devotion more i guess actually in this deck um the devotion is better than the flip yeah because we gain three life and we drain one um so I guess it depends. If you're trying to end the game, then you might flip it because you're going to do a little bit more damage. You're going to gain less life unless you're just like looping Gary in some disgusting way. Um, I think we can cut the sanitarium skeleton. We have enough creatures um, where like, I guess, how does this work? So if, if Gary is in the graveyard and we have tortured existence and we get sanitarium skeleton, we can play, we can swap skeleton for gary into our hand replay gary and then bring back sanitarium skeleton so sanitarium skeleton becomes a very slow grindy card advantage engine with tortured existence while also being food for the sacrifice stuff and i think having that is plenty good like end step we return it to our hand we replay it in that case though then it's better to be persistent specimen yeah persistent specimen is probably I mean, Persistent Specimen might just want to be in here anyways. Um, it's just a very good card. You see, the Persistent Specimen directly feeds our Village Rights, Corrupted Conviction, Fanatical Offering, Deadly Dispute, Costly Plunder, Reckoner's Bargain stuff, right? Um, so, yeah. All right, I think we're gonna, we are going to wrap things up. This has been a really fun return to the streaming in the new year in 2024. And uh, I'm really grateful for everybody who's joined us today. Thank you, uh, Alex, and everyone else who's hung out for the live stream and contributed your thoughts. I think we've got a really fun deck here. Um, Gary is, you know, an iconic creature, and you just don't see people talking a ton about their Gary lists. They oftentimes post and they ask, like, hey, is Gary good? I noticed you could play in the command zone, but I noticed that there wasn't really any content on it. Um, and I think that this is a really a really good um, approach to it. Um, you know, the final numbers by the numbers, uh, 16 removal spells, 11 drain, three edicts, seven ramp sources or mana acceleration, 21 draw spells, 22 creatures, um, three graveyard hate, four protection, 35-ish lands, five reanimation recovery spells, a Demir house guard for tutoring and four wraths, as well as two stacks effects for flicker decks. Um, Pretty awesome. Total price of the deck here came out to be 61 bucks, but I think if you went to your cheapest version, um, we would get it down even lower. Um, I wonder what's making it expensive here. Um, Alex asks, are you feeling Lagrella the Magpie? Yeah, Lagrella the Magpie is a, is a very dirty commander that nobody really plays. Um, Nate Diggity7 played a lot of Lagrella in like a mid-range flicker. Um, you know, with the initiative, um, it, it's kind of cool. It's kind of like, um, um, one way to look at it is it's very similar to Cormella. If you build Cormella in sort of like a mid range combo deck, cause Cormella, you get three colors, which means you get, um, you get the pingers, you get three different initiative pieces, you get, um, amazing interaction, right? You've got counter spells, you've got sweepers, you've got removal, um, the whole damn thing. You've got ways to bounce it on land permanence. Um, and then your initiative creatures, your pingers, they all just become infinite mana outlets. Like if you have Ghostly Flicker, Peregrine Drake, and you make infinite mana, but you have nothing to do with it, then you can just flicker your creature endlessly with like a Witty Roast Master or with a Firebrand Archer and you win the game anyways. Or if you flicker the initiative, then that's your outlet as well. So just like packed with that. And Lagrella does the same thing. Lagrella just gets more ways to win the game that are also value engines. I really like cards that serve dual purposes. So like, you know, going off with no infinite mana outlet, um, but you have an initiative creature in play, that just wins the game. You just run through, you get all the lands out of your deck, you trap everybody in infinitely, you throw into the dead three infinite times, put every creature into play, you know, wh whatever it takes. But you're gonna, you're gonna, th you're gonna trap everybody to death. Um, so, yeah. Um, I think Lagrell is awesome. Yeah, I definitely think that's a good one. Um, I don't know that I could build it better than Nate Diggity. Uh, he's, he's a pretty talented deck builder. Um, 
I don't know, maybe. But you know, they, I'm more more focused and more interested on like mid range and control right now because um, you know not enough people are playing it. So. Um, and then Sutra Priest, yeah, like Sutra Priest just being like a generically good white card. And then you get to like infinite combo with Lagrala, which is really cool. Um, you get great fogs, you get um, a lot of like creature recursion. Yeah, it's very sweet. Very cool. Um, okay, so wrapping things up, I do want to thank all of the people who've contributed through Patreon. If you two are interested in joining Patreon and supporting financially the channel, you can go to patreon.com backslash common connoisseurs, where we have tiers starting as low as $2 a month. And I want to just take a moment to comment on this. Uh, something I've been thinking about quite a lot lately as we go into the new year is ways to, uh, to not, not to make this my sole job. All right, right. That, that, that may not be a realistic thing for, you know, for years, um, as long as I keep it up, maybe. Um, but there are pathways where, where it can become much more, uh, can, where it can contribute to my life significantly more with your guys' help. And that is that if everybody donates small amounts of money on a monthly basis, it starts to actually accumulate quite significantly. And so, some of the numbers that I did at the end of the year to figure out kind of like, you know, how much did we grow in the last year? I identified that we had 700 of you on Discord, 700 of you participating in this amazing format of CPDH. And if each one of you donated $1 a month to the Patreon or through whatever other source you want to do it through YouTube, um, that would be $700 a month. And that's actually starting to look like real money where I can invest in better cameras, I can use that money to pay an editor so that the content continues to increase in quality. I can start to explore some of my more outside the box ideas. And so we all need to keep in mind that we all have this like collective ability to leverage ourselves to support independent content creators so that they don't have to be beholden to corporations uh, for their money so that we don't have to clog the channel with advertisements. For example, if we did that, I wouldn't run ads. I wouldn't run ads on the streams at all. Right, ads pay me ten to twenty dollars a month right now uh, for me to break up the stream, for me to interrupt your enjoyment of this. I do that, right? And so, with people donating more money, we just get rid of that. We just just unbroken live stream, no interruptions to like shill anything or anything like that. And so, just consider that not just with me, but with other content creators. I really like Turin, for example, on YouTube. He does a lot of. Um, a lot of uh, Total War stuff. And he regularly has like 2,000 people watching him. And if each one of those person donated a single dollar, you wouldn't need any of the whales to contribute to the thing. You wouldn't need large donations. Everybody's just donating a, you know, an insignificant amount of money. And that's $12 a year for somebody to do $1 a month for a whole year. Um, so it's just, it's, it's something to think about with my channel here and everywhere else. Um, the things that we could unlock if people were to do that would be really, really dramatic. So I uh, just wanted to talk about that a little bit at length. Um, and if you're interested, you can, of course, go to the Patreon and join there. Um, but of course, regardless of whether you're contributing or not, I appreciate your interaction um, and your participation here. If you are still watching right now and you're enjoying this and you've enjoyed the time here, do something else that supports me financially, which of course is to just do the free thing and click the like and leave a comment. Um, even if you just click a like, that helps. What that does is it not only lets the algorithm know that uh, that you're enjoying the content and that other people like you should see the content as well, but it also increases the amount of AdSense I get. So all those things help it make more sustainable. Basically, the Patreon was like a really significant part of me being able to like put food on the table and to pay my rent uh, moving into um, uh, moving into 2024. So for everybody who contributed, thank you so much. We had a new uh, donation of, uh, of $50 a month um, from one of our top patrons. And, uh, and that was a really amazing uh, confirmation. So anywho, I think we're going to wrap things up here. Thank you everybody for joining us for Gary the Snail, Gray Merchant of Asphodel, some based mono black mid-range. Hope you all enjoyed the stream today. Make sure to go check out the Patreon if you want to support. And with that, Connoisseur is a fine common cardboard. Wherever you are in the multiverse, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll catch you on the battlefield. Peace out, friends.